So, dear ladies and gentlemen, a good afternoon. Also, a very warm welcome to this EMA multi-stakeholder webinar designed to support a key element in the implementation of the medical device regulations and specifically in relation to the implementation of the Article 117. I've been told just now that we have reached our maximum capacity of participants in the Adobe Connect room and that more than 350 people are watching the live broadcast. That is, of course, great news. I do indeed believe we have lined up all key parties to make this webinar a success and to match the high expectations you no doubt totally have. <clears throat> From the European Commission to Member States authorities in medical device and medicinal product fields to notified body bodies, but also pharma, biotech industry, uh, manufacturers of medical devices and of course industry association. I'd like already to express my big thank you to all of you that contributed to making this webinar a reality. This was by no means totally straightforward. As you know, this webinar was planned to take place in March this year as a face-to-face -face meeting, but had to be postponed for reasons that we are by now very well aware of. And it meant also that we had to redesign its format to fit a virtual sit setup. And I believe also to say that in the meantime, we have all of us have got a couple of months of experience in holding these kind of meetings virtually. So here we are. Um, next slide. Well, before entering into the regulation itself, it's important that we recollect for a few moments about the PIP scandal, as indeed it has been credited to triggering one of the most significant changes in regulatory framework in the recent years. After the PIP scandal, the Commission embarked on what you might call a full overhaul of the medical device reg legislations, and as a result, uh, new uh, medical device regulations as well as in vitro diagnostic regulations were adopted in 2017. I think the idea behind this, of course, is to have a modern and more robust new regulatory framework but of course, with the scandal in the back of our mind, it is clear that the main ambition and objective of this regulation is the protection of public health and ensuring public and patient safety. And basically, to fulfill those ambitions, it's clear that the regulations are actually introducing new responsibilities also on medicines authorities, including the EMA. And you can see in this slide that a number of new and revised consultation procedures were actually introduced. The ancillary medicine substances, the consultation procedure on medical device composed of substances and the companion diagnostics. And, and that's a big end, the Article 117 impacting on drug device combinations. So famously or infamously, you will know all too familiar, be too familiar with the Article 117 and its wide-ranging impact. Uh, indeed, if you look on the right side, just in the context of centrally authorized products, you can see that 25% of centrally authorized products do include a medical device component. And underneath the majority of those being crystal syringes, previous pens, or inhalers, but also a number of them have medical devices incorporated and co-packaged in the, in the medicinal product box. Next slide, please. So what makes this Article 117 so impactful? I think what is key is that this Article 117 has introduced a fundamental change in how a certain combination of medicine, medical, medicinal products and medical devices are regulated. And if you look at the, on the left side, where under the current system, the components of a medicinal product that includes, for example, a preferred syringe, will be entirely reviewed by medicines authority, while from 26th of May uh, next year, then it will be uh, engaging a notified body to perform a review of the safety and the performance of the devices as part of such medicinal products. Recognizing, of course, and that's a very important point, that notified bodies have um, uh, an essential, I would say, and a complementary expertise in that area, but then also specifically requiring a certification and an opinion to be included as part of a medicinal product application that includes such device. Next slide. 
So if we look on paper, that this article seems to be relatively small change. It has generated, in fact, a lot of interest, but also a numerous discussions, numerous letters, and even position papers that were addressed to the regulators and the European Commission over the past three years. And you can see in the slide that there is specific concerns were raised in relation to respective roles and responsibilities, the scope of the notified bodies, but also maybe uh, concerns about timelines and, and, and uh, possible duplication. And you will find that the webinar today has these uh, concerns at, at the center uh, of the debate. So in an effort to address some of these concerns, EMA and the network developed the quality guidelines. <coughs> as well as a set of questions and answers to facilitate the implementation of the Article 117 uh, and this particular requirement. And so these documents and the guidelines specifically will actually be used as a basis to stimulate today a truly impressive multi-stakeholder uh, endeavor that does, in my opinion, stimulate in the webinar that we are having today. So ladies and gentlemen, today's webinar is bringing together all relevant stakeholders to discuss, to listen, and to learn on critical points in relation to this Article 117. And with all advantages, but also limitation of a virtual setup, I would like to wish you a fruitful discussion and a most enjoyable day. Thank you very much. And with this, I would like to hand over to Armin Wissart to provide more details on the objectives of this meeting, as well as run you through the proposed agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you, Saeed, and also a very warm welcome from my side. Uh, this has been an enormous undertaking, given all of the challenges that we face um, as a result of um, all the known um, circumstances that have been with us for the greater part of this year. I will um, very briefly go over the objectives of today. As um, Said has already outlined, this really is an opportunity for a very large group of stakeholders to come together and have as much as possible, given the opportunities as well as limitations of this platform, to be interactive and engaging in the two topics that we have chosen. And the reason we have chosen those two topics is that uh, they were identified in numerous discussions across the board as being high priority. We are fully aware there are a number of other questions which in all likelihood we will not be able to address today, so the focus really is on those two topics and uh, give everybody a chance to uh, discuss, learn from the limited experience that we have, but also then engage in discussions on how we might improve um, and um, facilitate the process going forward. And of course, none of the questions that are addressed today will be lost and they will uh, be taken up in any future format, whether it's Q&As or any other form of guidance. So very briefly, um, this is the agenda. You've seen it all. I'm not going to go into um, any detail. I'm, um, I think the, um, the, the co-chair of uh, this session has had difficulties connecting. So I'm just trying to see whether he managed to do this in the meantime. Um, as this really is a spirit of cooperation that we have um, co-chairs moderating the, um, the sessions. We have two sessions, as I said. The first one really focusing on the notified body opinion process. Here we're uh, very lucky to have representatives from industry, Björk Hunter, uh, representing FBA from Novo Nordisk that will uh, discuss the industry experience, uh, the team and B feedback on the, no the notified bo uh, body opinion opinions uh, to date from Jonathan Such BSI and Julia Frese from TÜV Süd. And we also have the assessor perspective from Maeve Lally from HPRA. And then this will result in a um, panel discussion and we're very happy and lucky to have a very broad representation from the European Commission, uh, B6 devices, uh, device industry, device authorities, and um, industry representing large and small Company. So with that, I'd like to hand over to Björk to give her presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, uh, thank you very much uh, for the introductions. Uh, I'm here, as, uh, as Armin said, to, to, rep to represent uh, the experience from, from industry. Um, and uh, first of all, I would like to just uh, thank everyone who has been contributing to these slides. It's by no means uh, this the work of, of me. 
And I've had a, a great uh, participation from across the industry and industry groups uh, to help put these uh, uh, slides together to present the shared um, uh, learnings that we've had uh, through uh, obtaining notified body opinions. And so um, what I would like to go through today is really that experience. So it, it, it's experiences that we've had in this process. Um, of course, uh, uh, as was mentioned earlier, when the uh, Article 117 uh, was actually uh, introduced, um, I think a lot of us uh, read it in, in the pharmaceutical industry and, and were not too sure what it would mean to us. And, and so some of us uh, got together, um, wrote a uh, paper, and also uh, the, uh, the, um, uh, the, 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 the and letter, as was mentioned earlier as well, to, to the Commission. There is something here that we need to talk about because we're not quite sure what the what the implications are, uh, and 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 this this is where this great collaboration I think has started. In, in we've had many discussions since then. Uh, from an industry perspective, we provide several um, uh, trying to uh, really advocate around some of the clear um, so where there are some processes that going to work. Um, and, and a lot of this, uh, I think we have uh, spoken to the fact that that um, that the, these are medicinal products, and, and this uh, uh, some of the um, uh, some of the the, the points of clarity is, is needed um, around this, uh, these reviews. And we've also obviously recognised very much that there's been some great um, uh, input from both EMA and Team NB, uh, which has also been mentioned before. And I'm also looking forward to, to more information in this space. So there's certainly a lot of uh, it's in, in collaboration that's happened here, a lot of positions, a lot of really good information. Um, and now we've actually come to the place where we've also been through this uh, process, uh, some of us at least, in obtaining this notified body opinion. Um, and there are still some remaining uncertainties, and I think some of that is what we will try to address today, and, and really looking forward to all the great discussions. Um, what I will do in this presentation is, is looking at, at the left side of this <laughs> of, of, of these uh, 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 in terms of, of what is the what is the uncertainties around the process of obtaining a notified body, what have we learned, um, what is the content of the information going into the to having this notified body opinion review, and what does the notified body opinion report actually looks like. Um, there are also, also some uncertainties related to the MAA review. We've not touched on that in this specific presentation. But that would be great uh, to have some discussions around that. Uh, also, changes and maintenance, which will be um, which will be addressed in the next session. Um, so, uh, what we've actually done is we have collected some experience uh, of obtaining notified body opinions from across 13 different companies within the industry. Uh, we've actually uh, looked at how, across how many notified bodies this is, and it's across two different notified bodies, and we've discussed why it's two. Um, but we believe it's because um, the designation process of the notified bodies means that that in order for to be able to start on this process earlier on this year, which is, was was probably when most of uh, most of us have started, when like the notice, the MDR was going to be enforced in, in May uh, of this year rather than next. Year. Um, it, it was it was the two, uh, the two there was two notified bodies that were accessible to start these uh, reviews. And the, the reviews has also been done across pre-filled syringes and pen injectors. And again, this is just a, a, a coincidence that it's been across these type of products. And but we wanted to make sure that it was clear that this was the, what the, um, the experience that we've gathered is, is, is based on. So first of all, I'd like to just talk a little bit to the actual process of obtaining the notified body opinion and the experience we've had here. And generally, it's worked really well in terms of the good collaboration, um, but there are also some improve, points of improvement, and these are really more around the areas where there's need for clarity. Um, everyone in this process have been very uh, and, and willing to communicate and, 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 and knowing that we are all learning here, and, and that's been really great. Um, we've had a clear communication with the, with the notified bodies. Uh, we've had flexibility in the review options and timelines to suit the different projects and uh, programs. We had um, overall timelines generally, the experiences that they've been met. Also had the opportunity to actually have accelerated reviews when that has been uh, needed um, to, to, to meet some short time frame. We've seen flexibility from EMA in allowing notified body opinions to be submitted actually before May 2021, um, and we had started that. So some of us have started that process, and also flexibility in timelines around the submission. 
and of course recognition all the way around that we're all uh, learning here and that this is a new process. And, and so that has worked really well. In terms of the things where we think there could be some improvement, some companies uh, have had uh, some difficulties around access to notified bodies if they've not been working in the medical device field before. Uh, we've also seen that uh, when we've asked for reviews, the availability of the, of the review time slot could very much be dependent on the reviewer. Uh, we've also seen that some interim time points we've not been so clear, and I will get, I'll get to that a little bit later on, is that the process of obtaining this notified body is not just going and get a notified body and then, and then that's it. There's quite a few steps to it, and, and, and we've also seen quite extensive Q&A rounds up to about five uh, in some instances. Um, but there's, there's definitely a bit of, of back and forth. And I think some of that is, is also because it's not been clear necessarily where the level of detail is needed to, to do the review. Um, and for, um, and, you know, that, that, that could at least be, be one of the reasons for this. Uh, we've also seen that there's been some uncertainty around the alignment over towards the uh, MAA um, and, and what is needed um, to be reviewed by the notified body. Um, it, Relation to what can be reviewed by by EMA, and I, I will also get to that a little bit later on. Um, and then finally, there have been uh, some companies looking at biosimilars and generic, uh, who uh, has experience, experience that there's they're still a need here to to establish some knowledge uh, around those. So what does the process look like? And we wanted to just uh, include this slide because we were all sort of talking about the process was a bit more than just going as I said to get an notified body opinion. So so you start by contacting your notified body, you agree some timelines, and you uh, agree for a submission to get a quote, contact, and then you submit your technical information. And then you actually go through this um, of, of question and answer or insufficiency report, depending on, on what it's called. And you go through that process, getting to somewhere where you all, um, where, where all the, the questions from the notified body have put out. You go into this sort of final uh, bit where there will be a report, a sort of a report um, by, by the notified body that will then be reviewed by the company, and then you will have the final report. So there's actually quite a lot of steps to this process, and the length of this we've seen around two to six months. Um, so it can really vary in the details uh, that's being asked about, and, and also, of course, the timelines that have been agreed um, in advance. Um, We'll come to, to talk a little bit about what we've experienced in the actual technical review and the content of the review. So this is the, the, the documentation we've prepared for the notified body to review. Um, and here we've actually seen quite a different approach uh, between the notified bodies. Um, we've seen that in the technical review, the level of detail that's been requested by the notified body have been quite uh, different. We've experienced some instances where we felt it's been more of an audit approach, where it's been a really deep dive into a specific area. In other instances, it's been more of a summary view. And the expectations of, of the technical submission package has not necessarily been, at least, been very clear. Um, some uncertainty around what is needed. Uh, this also feeds into to the fact that when, when we do have late coming data, uh, then there's been some discussions around how do we manage that. For example, if we have processes that have not uh, run through um, or labeling uh, has also been mentioned, um, then it can be difficult. Is it possible for the for the five bodies to then say we've seen this partially? Uh, is it possible to, to 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 sort of say that someone else could look at it? And 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 that some have said that 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 it, a partial review has been able has been possible. Others have said they want to see the full uh, documentation. Um, so it, it also seems to be a slight different interpretation of uh, GPR. So, so there's been uh, something around that. And then as well, the interpretation of the notified bodies remit versus EMA's remit. And again, this is very much related back to some of the late coming data, because how much data does the notified body need compared to what email will be, be seeing, and generally how the notified body opinion will actually be used in the review with the um, uh, MAA. This is just to give an example. For example, uh, to highlight why this, why this can be a little bit confusing is because if you look at something, for example, like risk documentation, you have many layers of risk documentation, um, and which is illustrated in this pyramid here. So if you said, well, I need to see some risk documentation, and of course that should be part of the review of the notified body, uh, by the notified body to obtain a notified body opinion, 
could really be anything from a high high risk high level risk summary uh, that maybe uh, industry would be used to putting into our um, MMA, for example, or it could be all the way down uh, to actually seeing risk mitigation activities. A very big difference in, in, in this level of, of detail is, is what is actually needed. This uh, becomes even more difficult when we're looking at, the, for example, late coming data. But some of these uh, risk mitigations may be needed to be confirmed by some late coming data, and if that's coming late, how are we going to make the timeline? Um, if the, the last thing we've looked at is the, our experience with the notified body opinion itself. So this is the report that's being issued by the notified body. Um, and actually what we've seen here is that the notified body opinion content is, is, is very detailed and, and maybe a bit more detailed than we thought. Uh, it's also um, uh, detailed uh, information in, in the report uh, is, is different from, from, from what we can gather. And one of the reasons we know that is because we've had seen a very big difference in how uh, large these reports are. So we've seen some down to 20 pages, some have been all over 100 pages, and this is across similar products. Uh, so it's not to do with the complexity of the product, but more in to do with the level of information that's been provided in the notified body opinion. Uh, we see detailed uh, um, documentation uh, that's copied from our technical documentation, for example, pictures, and other details of information, and then of course, what you would expect uh, as well, the GSPR checklist, uh, whether um, it's or not, and whether it's reviewed. Um, and then uh, of course, as well, what we've seen uh, is, is, is that it, uh, because of this high level of detail, we have had to have this second step of reviewing the, the notice body opinion to make sure that, that all the information in there um, is, is correct. Um, and then finally, we've had an observation around this, and, and it's it, that it, it's not been either positive or negative. It, it's been a report that stated what has been assessed. Um, and, and really, what we would like to have discussion about here is, is what is actually the right level of information needed for, for EMA in this, in this notified body when no body opinion, when, when, when the review of the MAA is conducted. And, and here we just set it up as it could be really anything from a certificate that says this is what has been reviewed. It's an extremely detailed report, and I think right now it's not clear exactly where we are in between these two, or whether it is one or the other. And, and, and so this is one of the things we think that that, uh, that that could be around this problem statement of why we're seeing such different uh, levels of, of detail. Um, so just wanted to round up with the key messages from, from us in terms of the experiences that we've had. Uh, we think there is are, are a number of, of, of points for clarification. And, and we will be addressing uh, hopefully some of those in our discussion a bit later on. Um, but uh, generally, the themes um, are, are around um, how this will be um, in a bit more of a standardized way, uh, what the, the specific timelines are around it, um, and whether we can have a bit more clear definition around roles and responsibilities. Um, so finally, really, I think the experience has been has been great. Um, as, as I said in, in the beginning, uh, there has been a lot of really good um, collaboration and, and and willingness to make this work for all parties. But we think there is a need to standardize. At the moment, it, it, the, the process is not standardized, and it means that we end up with very different things. Um, and so we think there needs to be some standardization uh, in relation to the technical review, what level of detail needs to be seen, the notify body opinion itself, how it's being used in the NAA, and maybe some guidance around this could be, could be very, very helpful. Because, of course, what we all want is, is to provide safe and effective medicines for, 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 for patients. Uh, so with that, um, I would like to thank everyone who has been uh, contributing to the I would like to thank all the, the different um, uh, that have been um, providing input to this from across industry and of course for inviting me here to speak today. And now it's over to uh, team notified body, please. Um, yeah, thank you very much for the introduction and the possibility to speak here and to share our experience um, with you when um, preparing notified body opinions. Um, besides me, Jonathan Such from BSI will also uh, introduce to you um, will be part of, of the agenda and the documentation requirements and also the language we have seen when assessing those documents. 
also frequently asked questions which have been provided the, uh, to the manufacturers. And Jonathan will um, explain to you how Notified Bodies pre prepare the opinion report and how Human B is working on additional um, guidances with regard to the template of this report and what are the challenges um, which we do face um, with, with this aspect. As a notified body, we do follow actually a key process when certifying medical devices. And this process consists for us of two pillars, the technical documentation assessment and the auditing of manufacturer's quality management system, focusing on manufacturer's facilities and processes. Once compliance for both aspects could be confirmed, manufacturer does receive a so-called EU certificate and allowing to place the, which allows the manufacturer to place the device on the market. The quality management system is subjected of early surveillance activities through the notified body. And those are actually the two pillows which have been also introduced this Article 117 to combination products of single and service products, which uh, says that manufacturer can provide the marketing authorization dossier either a new certificate, um, a declaration of conformity, or an article, uh, a notified body opinion. Um, for a notified body opinion, one pillow for our assessment is skipped. So therefore, manufacturer do focus mainly on the review of, man of notified bodies, do focus mainly on the review of technical documentation. When submitting to us the technical documentation part for, for the device constituents, manufacturers are requested to comply with applicable general safety and performance requirements and to the document the information of conformity by justification, validation, and verification of the solution which have been adopted to meet those requirements. We as Team and B have prepared a so-called position paper in the beginning of this year, which should um, provide clear information how to compose um, the manufacturer technical documentation when submitting this for assessment at the notified body for notified body opinion. And what we have seen is that a good approach to compose this document is to follow this hierarchical aspect. So a GSTR checklist would be an ideal format when um, identifying whether GSTRs are applicable or not applicable. And it's important that those are justified and not only crossed or marked as not applicable. Also for the GSTRs, a reference to the methods used or demonstrated to confirm that the GSTR has been met by the data set should be stated and included in this list harmonized standards or any common specification in case applicable and available or also other guidelines which have been applied um, to confirm the GSPR should be identified. And what is quite important is that um, the traceability and identification of the data which then confirms the evidence should be given to the respect GSPR. Um, the GSPR checklist should be accomplished by the so-called top-level summary report, and those reports can be um, consist from the input which come from subcontractors or suppliers of the manufacturer, but they should clearly demonstrate that also the marketing authorization holder is in control of the product. And the next level of documents to be submitted is actually the detailed report and the data which we um, confirm the GSPR. Um, here is an example for GSPR 10.1, where evidence is to be presented for the biocompatibility of the, of the product. And actually, um, as explained, the first level is a GSPR checklist. The next level of the document to be provided is actually the biocompatibility summary report, which is also part of IV10. Project, um, which where supplier statement of conformity can be reviewed and implemented. The supplier statement by themselves should then be provided, 
and also the assessment of the biocompatibility of, of single components um, with the corresponding data and discussion and conclusion. What is very well presented to us so far um, is this first two levels. So the GSTR checklist identified as it, those GSTRs are applicable and also summary reports are provided. And what is in, then can be read in the summary reports is that additional evidence can be found in report XYZ. However, this report is not submitted to, to us for verification. Another example uh, for 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 the documentation, where um, documentation from the manufacturer but also from the supplier should has to be composed with regard to the management um, and risk management process. And here, um, what has been seen that um, it's it's a challenge for manufacturer to com combine not only or to identify not only the risk for the drug and the device itself, but also to consider and to not for forget components which are part of, of a possible um, pre-filled syringe or pen, for example, or also the device supplier risk. What are the common questions which we do ask the manufacturers when it comes um, to, to, the, to the review process? Um, for example, the question on the clinical use for, for the device combination, and this is to understand what is the relative risk of the medicinal substance, which is also linked to control and accuracy of the device. Um, in general, also questions are asked with regard to the overall process, where we do um, requesting manufacturer to confirm, for example, the incoming inspections, in process controls, release certification, or also process validation data for the device, and whenever needed also for the combination. Um, some administrative aspects are requested and to be clarified, for example, conformity of the marketing authorization holder address um, versus the contracting entity, as those are not always um, the same. Also, confirming the name and addresses of significant subcontractors or crucial suppliers, which then provide also parts of the objective evidence to be reviewed, which is then confirming that the GSTR has been met. Um, for the documentation, as already indicated before, when we see the reports or references but not provided, this is then requested, and also user requirement specification, for example, or sometimes IT when they are not part of the submission. For the risk management, um, the risk management um, GSTR asks that the manufacturer does perform a risk management, management assessment based on the risk management plan and reports for activities carried out, and this is, for example, something where information is missing. Um, TC or CRM substances, and here um, certificates should be provided or are requested from those suppliers of the components um, which do contain, for example, uh, such kind of materials or provide evidence as materials are not included into their um, device itself or process agent. John, I think it's now your turn. So I think we need to go back to the team notified body and give the floor to Jonathan Such. Thank you. Uh, Julia was covering the documentation that is required and the level of detail, and it was seen from the questions that a lot of our questions are about ensuring that we have the correct uh, level of detail, and that's because, uh, as she explained, we need to verify and validate uh, compliance to Annex 1 of the MDR, and we don't have access uh, or we don't audit your QMS system. We are not part of the life cycle, um, so the same uh, tools that we would have for a device. So at the time of the review, we need to validate. So that's the reason behind the uh, documentation request and typically the additional uh, questions to get the right level of detail so that we can do that validation. 
once we have that information, what we then will do is uh, write a notified body opinion. Now, uh, at the moment, this takes the form of a report. So we want it, uh, to make a couple of things clear to the competent authorities who have assessment of the final development. So we want to make it clear which version of the device is evaluated. This is important. As you've heard around the timelines, it's expected that the uh, pharmaceutical manufacturers will be coming to notified bodies a little bit before they are ready for the MAA. So it's important to know that we are evaluating the version of the device that's going to be commercialized as the version that's going to be in the MAA. We also want to make it clear to the competent authority exactly what we've looked at for two reasons. One, to give them confidence that the device part uh, does conform to MDR, and the other part is important to give enough detail so they can be assured uh, of the data that we've looked at so there's uh, as little duplication as possible, um, where data are not being re-reviewed uh, by the two. And finally, and I'll explain this a bit more in a bit more detail, uh, any gaps need to be cleared to the content of the So, um, if your useful feedback on notified bodies is, is on what we can call version one of the notified body uh, opinion, we have had uh, some feedback in this presentation, and so I'll also be able to talk about what we're doing in the future. Version one, uh, on information we include it uh, this is across the notified bodies a detailed review of each GSPR talking about whether it was applicable or not whether we agreed with that rationale or not um, saying or no to but we also had an option uh, of partial compliance and again I'll explain why we did that going with that result as we went into detailed review of each individual GSPR, um, I accept that it led to a relatively long notified body. Move, try again. So we have uh, already had some feedback from the competent authorities on the opinions that we've done. Uh, the short answer is that they are too detailed and there's too much information in there for them. So, you know, while as notified bodies, we've got plenty of experience in reviewing devices, this is also a new area for us. And the, the uh, that we're doing in this meeting is exactly what we need to help uh, fine tune these processes. So, as Team MB, we're putting together a template which we hope to publish um, for notified bodies to use for the notified body opinion, and it's still covered make clear, I appreciate this is small, but you will see the template when it, it'll make clear uh, whether uh, the device conforms to the various parts. We will have a higher level summary, perhaps, of the questions that we have looked at for the competent authority to read through. There are also sections here, depending on the type of device, which may or may not be included in the final version. And then finally, we will have a section called recommendations. One thing that we have removed from this, again, based on their feedback, is the option for partial compliance. So in the past, we'd use partial compliance, uh, if you like, where we'd ha had a minor nonconformity, something that in the device world we could perhaps track um, minor conformity, so we could issue a certificate, you know, but we would corrective actions have been made. That isn't an option. We don't have that kind of life cycle with a notified body opinion. So our original solution was to have this partial compliance. The competent authorities' argument, uh, which I understand, is that that's not very useful to them. Um, you know, they need to know whether it's positive or negative. So this is where the recommendations to competent authority come in. So if there are missing data, uh, stability is an easy example. We may have stability on the device components, but not on the final itself, or certainly not as long as the shelf life the manufacturer might be claiming at the time of the MAA, um, say, yes, it complies up to X months. We've seen the protocol. We've seen the component data. Um, you know, so we would be happy for that device, uh, for, for the uh, extended, uh, assuming there is sufficient data without it being reviewed again by the notified body. 
for example. So the recommendations to the Comfort Authority is really our opportunity to uh, point out any gaps to them, uh, and then during their review, they can decide how significant those are towards the overall uh, compliance of the product. Uh, this slide just shows a few challenges from our point of view uh, as team MBs. We've been trying to. First one is um, knowing exactly how the notified body opinion will be used, what the competent authorities need from it, from us. To see that it's been done is picked. So the certificate approach, if you like, if you're uh, looking for in particular. This is very important um, where there's overlap. Um, you know, uh, responsibility, as I said, to make sure that we're not duplicating data. A good example of this is around sterilization. So a pre-filled syringe, for example, may not be terminally filled, it may be aseptically filled. The, the final microbial um, status of that product is, of course, the remit of the competent authority. But part of the assurance of getting to that final status of the incoming goods, so you, you'll have sterile compatibility handled is all part of the quality management system open question is all of that left to the competent authorities are they expecting some assurance from the notified bodies with respect to for example the sterilization state of the device parts or will the micro reviewer from the authority need to see that themselves as part of a part of assuring the microbial state so that's that's a little bit of an unknown um, shelf life is another of where there's overlap, but I've talked about that. Uh, there's still the challenge around what to do around incomplete data, so I've talked about what our potential solution is with respect to comments. Um, uh, that, for example, we might only be seeing draft patient information, importantly, to mit risk mitigation. So it's a key part of our review, but how do we ensure that, um, you know, CGR on our review is in the final uh, version that the panel will see. And we also don't know, you know, with these open questions, how that's going to work during submission. So will the MAA, uh, sorry, will the competent authority ask questions to the notified body? Will they ask them to the manufacturer of the notified body? Uh, how will that process work? We don't know. We haven't been through that yet. Finally, how do we handle uh, if there are gaps? Is, is a gap and a negative opinion, you know, the end of it for that product, or is there is there chance for uh, remediation by the authorities? So th these are parts we'd really enjoy uh, discussing today. So in final words then from those five bodies, uh, reviews have gone quite well to date. Um, the manufacturers need to be aware that the level of detail that's asked for under the MDR is significantly greater than when they were self-certifying under the MDD, uh, regardless of the complexity uh, of your uh, combination products. And, and we recommend that you use your supplier's knowledge uh, when putting together your files and make sure you uh, provide what uh, is a work in progress. Uh, as I explained, we're hoping it will be simple in the future, um, but it's behind it, the level of detail uh, is expected to remain the same. And as I also said, we're hoping to publish a template on the notified body opinion uh, later this year. So uh, I look forward to discussion to later. Thank you very much, Tyson. So I'd now like to invite Maeve um, Lally from the HPRA to give the um, assessor's perspective on the notified body opinion. Mef, over to you. Thank you. Okay, so I start again with a brief introduction. My name is Maeve Lally. I'm a senior biological assessor in the Health Products Regulatory Authority in Dublin. So I'm going to give a presentation on the notified body opinion from the experience of assessors that we have gained to date with this new procedure for us all. So can I get the next slide, please, Armin? I'm not able to navigate them. Thank you. So very brief disclaimer, and then on to the next slide, please. So this is very much an assessor's overview of how we have dealt with Article 117 to date in relation to the requirement for applicants or MA holders to provide an opinion on the conformity of the device part with the relevant GSP words as set out in Annex 1 of the new medical device regulation. 
So moving to the next slide. The sorry, I actually have control next. So so the remit of the assessor in the Medicines Competence Authority under Direct 2001-83-EC is the assessment of any risk relating to the quality, safety, or efficacy of the medicinal product. And this is very much one of the core principles of the draft drug device combination guideline, whereby the assessment of the suitability of the device for its intended purpose should take into account relevant quality aspects of the device itself and also the context of its use with the medicinal product. So assessors will be taking a holistic approach to the assessment of the drug device combination and looking at the complexity of the device, the patient characteristics in the intended patient population, any specific user requirements, clinical settings, or the use environment, with an overall aim of ensuring that the benefit risk in relation to quality, safety, and efficacy of the finished medicinal product is positive. But also one of the principles of the guideline is to ensure that we minimize duplication of effort for everybody's sake, regulatory authorities, notified bodies, and the MA holder. So when we were devising the original template guideline, we proposed a template for how a notified body opinion could possibly look. And in Annex 1, we had suggested an overarching document where we would have a administrative information on a cover page. And then within the body of the opinion, we had requested a brief summary, so including the version of the device, the acceptability or not of the opinion, and the basis on which the notified body was forming that opinion, and a clear outline of any relevant constraints or considerations. Within the report, we had also suggested that we would get an overview of the assessment of the GSPRs, the basis of the assessment, the general product information on the drug device combination, the scope of the assessment, and the summary again of the opinion. And we also had proposed a template that would be completed by the MA holder with a bit more of the administrative information that would not necessarily have been available to the notified body, so linking it to the specific procedure number or to the version of the device. So that was what we had suggested, and now I'm going to show you what we've actually received. But please bear in mind, this is based on a very small sample size. The notified body opinions have just started to be submitted with a few um, applications to date, and they, um, so our experience is relatively limited. But what we have received, the first product, and I'll take you through a few of these products, I'm, the first product was a biological. It was a new active substance in a pre-filled syringe to be combined with a safety syringe or an auto-injector. So the MA holder presented the device information within the, the common technical document and in, within module three of the dossier. And the way the data was presented was very much in line with what we had suggested in the draft guideline. So, Within section P1 on product information, we had a very brief description. In P2, which is the pharmaceutical development section, as well as the development studies around the drug, the drug product, we also got the development studies for the drug device combination. So this included the design verifications against relevant ISOs, design validations, summaries of human factor studies, and clinical studies. In section P3, where the manufacturer, where the MA holder describes the manufacturing process, here as well as the manufacturing process for a biological product, so your aseptic sterilization and fill finish, you also had after your fill finish the actual assembly process for assembling the drug device combination, as well as registration of any of the in-process controls around those unit operations. Section P5, which is the control of the drug substance, contains the finished product specifications, so the list of quality specifications against which every batch of drug product will be tested and must comply in order to be QP released. And within this section, the applicant has included some device-specific considerations. So for pre syringes, we might expect to see break loose glide force, needle penetration force, seal integrity, delivery time, activation force, and these relevant ones will be expected to be included here. In P7, where we have the more detailed description of the container closure system, as well as the primary packaging, the applicant described the drug device combinations. We were given diagrams, materials of construction, critical material attributes. 
infection P8, where we see the stability data, as well as the stability data in the primary packaging. We also, the prefilled syringe, there was also stability data which had been generated for the drug device combinations, both at long term and accelerated storage conditions, and also protocols for ongoing stability studies. And then in section 3.2 or, and this is the regional information, and it was in this section where the applicant presented the human factor study, the clinical study summary, and the notified body opinions for its safety syringes and the auto injectors. So looking at the notified body opinions which were provided, we received two, um, one for the, the safety syringe and one for the automated injector. Each was less than 30 pages. The notified body chose not to use the EMA draft template as per the guidance document, but all the information that we had suggested was clearly included. So there was a clear link to the EMA holder, the version of the drug device combination, the internal reference numbers. There was a clear conclusion stated this device met the requirements of Article 117 and it had been reviewed by looking at technical documentation against Annex 1 of the Medical Device Regulation. And within the report, the notified body gave a general description of the product as aligned with Module 3 and also set out the context or the clinical purpose for the drug device, so the patient indications, the patient use environment, and this was aligned with the SPC. We also then got a tabular format of assessment of GSPRs, and you have seen this briefly, um, and there was a clear conclusion on whether it was yes, no, or partial. I must say I'm relieved to see that partial may not be um, continuing on in this format because yes and no is a much clearer statement as an assessor to receive. But you can see here for GSPR 13.2, the notified body confirms that it complies with the relevant GSPR and then gives a little bit of information on what has been reviewed. So in this instance, the TSC statements for the processing conditions comply with the, those, um, meet the requirements of the EMA TSC guideline for medicinal products for human use. So I won't go through everything again for the second product, but just to um, elucidate them, here we had a monoclonal antibody. Again, it was a biosimilar assembled with either a safety syringe or an automated injector. And similar types of information were presented, maybe in slightly different sections of the dossier. But again, in P2, this was where the main bulk of the device information was to be found around the design verification plan and report, details of any scale up to the manufacturing process that might affect the um, device assembly, and also some transport validation studies. Importantly, again, this applicant considered that the, the um, assembly of the drug device combination is considered part of the registered manufacturing process, and this was registered and controls included in the dossier, and device-specific specifications were included in the finished product specifications. 3-2-OR was where we found the notified body opinions. We also found the device risk management plan. The, um, we found the use-related risk assessment and the threshold analysis findings report. The human factors and usability studies in this dossier were presented in the overview sections, but they were clearly signposted, so they were easy to find. And we got one notified body opinion with this application. What was interesting with this notified body opinion, again, it was similar in length and did not use the template as we had suggested. The administrative information was clearly there, and within the body of the report, we got all the relevant information with regard to the product description and the purpose of the drug device combination. However, what was also interesting here was in the introduction, the notified body clearly identified GSPOs where they could not confirm compliance. So they identified the gaps and they highlighted to the competent authority instances where the information had not been provided and where it would be useful. And this was considered extremely useful then to enable assessors to have a more targeted assessment. So just as an example here, we have GSPR 7 on transport and storage. It's very clear the notified body could not confirm compliance because transit studies had not been completed documentation was not available to demonstrate the suitability of the packaging for your transport. So as an assessor, I immediately know if I go back to my previous slide, 
to look for this information in the dossier, and sure enough, the applicant has presented because this data is now available and available for review. And as an assessor, I'm aware it's not part of the notified body opinion, and therefore there is an onus on me to look at it in greater detail. So slide product three then was also a biological monoclonal, and here we had a Lyme extension. So P2, again, we had the risk management plan, design verification plans, the human factor study, information on bridging from clinical to commercial products. And in 3-2-OR, we found certificates of conformance, GSPR assessments by the MA holder, and the notified body opinion. And in this dossier, the human factors engineering and human factors summary reports were presented in the clinical sections of the dossier. But again, once it was easily um, identified and signposted within the um, section P2, the assessors were aware of where the information was, were able to locate it and make the link themselves throughout the dossier. And the notified bodies for these um, were much longer. They were 80 and 100 pages each. Again, did not use the EMA draft template, but clearly presented all the information. And you have seen this in um, Bjorn's slide, I think, earlier, um, where there is a clear um, conclusion stated at the beginning where the notified body is confirming in tabular format that the device conforms Chapters 1, Chapter 2, and Chapter 3 of Annex 1 of Regulation um, 2017 45, 745. So we have here, and again, a general description aligned with Module 3 with the intended purpose, so we know that what has been looked at by the notified body is consistent with what is being applied for in the dossier. We have a clear assessment of the GSPRs, again in tabular format, a brief summary of the data reviewed and an overall conclusion. So if I am to summarize the notified bodies as we have seen them to date, you can see they vary in length, but there is consistency around the way the data is presented. There is clear link to the MA holder, the product name, the reference number for the device. Descriptions are aligned with module three, or where they're not, the notified body has identified this as a gap to be looked at for the assessors. The purpose. The clinical indication is either linked with the um, SPC as it is being registered, or again, it is being highlighted in an area where something needs to be checked by the assessor because the notified body could not confirm. Two of the notified bodies, notified body opinion three and four, included the device classification. This wasn't included in notified body opinions one and two. In all cases, it was clearly stated if there was alignment with GSPRs and a opinion was given. For notified bodies one and two, they gave a useful table summarizing the list of standards or technical standards or ISOs against which the um, against which the opinion was being given. And in notified bodies three and four, we got a summary of the risk assessment, which probably in contributed to the increased length for these notified body opinions. So the key take home messages from my slide for MA holders it is to include the relevant drug device combination information in your dossier in the format that is consistent with the draft guideline because this is underpinned by the guidance from notice to applicants and it is the format in where assessors are most likely to expect to find that information. If you have information in other sections of the dossier, it's generally not a problem as long as there's a clear cross-reference particularly if you're cross-referencing across modules. So for in instance, if information is not in module three but is found in certain clinical sections, those um, signposts are incredibly useful. And they might avoid questions unnecessarily during your assessment of your application. For the notified bodies, within the notified body opinion, the usefulness of a clear conclusion at the beginning cannot be understated. It is important if there are areas which are not assessed or could not be confirmed, that these are highlighted in the introduction because then these can be focused on by assessors during the application, the assessment of the application. If you are giving descriptions, ensure that there is consistency between the notified body opinion and what is intended to be registered in the dossier or SPC, or again, highlight any differences. Presenting the GSPORs in tabular format 
with an explanation for the decision is very, very useful. And that decision, as you have seen from the examples I've given, doesn't have to have a huge level of detail, sufficient detail to assure the assessor that the notified body was able to form an opinion. The medical device classification wasn't something that we had specifically requested, but it is very useful to include. Um, in conclusion, if the MA holder has clearly presented the device data in the dossier, and if the notified body has clearly outlined the conclusions and the reason for them in the notified body opinion, then we would like to assure you that there really will be little overlap or duplication of effort. The assessors will be cross-checking to make sure that what is in the notified body opinion details match what is in the SPC or dossier to ensure that we are looking at the same thing. But we will be assessing information which is relevant to the device in combination with the medicinal product. And we will be focusing on the gaps which have been identified or nonconformances which have been identified with GSP words. Thank you. And I would like to guide us now to the next agenda point, which is a panel discussion. Um, we have a number of panelists representing different uh, industry trade association as well as representatives from EC Santé devices and device authorities, which should lead to a very informative discussion. Of course, also all speakers from the presentation before will be part of the panelists. Um, I would like to ask each of the panelists before they speak to introduce themselves by name and affiliation, and please be a little bit mindful of time to allow uh, us to cover as much question as, as possible. So we have many, many questions and comments already uh, within the queue. However, I would like to start questions questions which was raised by Björk uh, in her presentation. And that is a question, I think, which is um, directed um, to the uh, authorities, but also to the notified body. And the question is, how can the notified body opinion review the process and report be standardized? Because everything what we heard so far is based on the notified body opinions provided by two notified bodies. And if the amount of notified bodies will increase, I really think there is a strong need for standardization. Sir Han, so Marin, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. And building on, on uh, Mike, what you just said on a standardized process, this is at least something I apologize. I need to introduce myself. My name is Maren von Trischen. I'm speaking on behalf of UCOPE, in particular, uh, concerns from SMEs. So when we talk about standardized process, and I would really like to build on what has been said previously, that by recognizing each party's mandate and building up all parties' knowledge and competence, we would really like and support the integrated pathway. I'm fully aware this is a bit high level. However, at the same time, when we talk about the details and technical implications, we are already a step further, whereas the majority of our companies don't even have an established relationship with the notified bodies. We know of the resources, constraints, at all parties, in particular um, at uh, notified bodies. And so this is really a plea for the need for an integrated pathway in order to really address the three major challenges, resource constraints at all parties, knowledge, it's, there is a lot of knowledge in the system, has cross-border knowledge and mutual understanding is needed, and timeline, because the overarching principle to bring early patient access, in particular for those innovative products that are drug device combination products. So when we stick to the timeline as set for um, medicinal product approval within the legal system, we do need to put all effort in joint forces to avoid any delay in patient access of innovative medicines with regard to the not defined 
timelines for notified body opinions. So when we talk about the technical implications, we still need to consider that many, not only SMEs, but many companies do not have an account at notified bodies yet. I know it's a bit beyond, but I, I would like to take this opportunity to bring this into a cousin. Thank you. If I can just jump in there um, quickly. So this is the beauty of um, being virtual and not being able to have eye contact um, to um, synchronize our intervention. But th thanks very much. You know, you're touching on a point that goes beyond the scope of today. It's, you know, we note it. But it does touch on a number of other questions that, um, you know, Mike has sort of introduced. And with respect to, you know, there's, there seems to be some duplication, some overlap. Um, it seems to be minimal. But really to go back, and maybe I can ask a representative from Team NB, you know, who wants to take the floor to see, you know, what in their perspective, you know, how can we achieve to um, – greatest and uh, get more efficiency, fully recognizing, you know, you have your legal mandate, as was just mentioned, with, with, with the two um, or two um, be done, but at the same time, you know, what can be covered, needs to be covered, and how can this uh, so that everybody has the benefit? Maybe have a reaction from team over. John, it's yours. Thank you. Um, well, the fact that we are Team MB is is uh, one step along the road to standardisation. You know, this is an important part in this. The feedback that we're getting from the reports, some parts that are standardised and are fixed. So, you know, Annex One of the MDR is very standardised. All notified bodies are designated against that, audited against that. So, you know, the reports we're doing are the same. The output is something, as we discussed, in terms of the report, uh, that's you know, it's still a work in progress. This is a new process for us. An authority our aim is to produce a template for notified bodies to use. We'll ensure a for all the different assessors to see them over time. Bodies are commercial organizations, so the way they organize Availability to um, and the this is something that's different. And uh, um, all I can say on that is just to you know make sure you start these conversations early. Your notified body so that you can work with an organisation that suits you. But for those bits that we can, as Team MB, which uh, represents the bodies and certainly those that are with scopes that will include the kind of thing about we all in to terms of our understanding of how the reviews are performed and what the output is. I think uh, the question from um, notified by um, point of view and uh, I really would like to uh, move over to one of the and please apologize that we really cover all of them, but I would like to um, select a question from uh, field. Uh, make slide six and phases a key point. Most of the device topic distributed across 3.2p are also covered within the notified body opinion. Twice, if we dilute the notified body opinion report back to a high-level summary, we will end up building the detail instead back into the dossier. So I think, Maeve, that's a question to you. Hi, can you hear me? Very well. Yes, okay, thank you. Yes, I, I think... This is an issue for the, the first while. Um, definitely in the dossiers that we have seen, I think the MA holders have erred on the side of putting everything into the dossier 
That has also been seen in the notified body opinion in case they get asked questions. Um, and certainly for some devices, we may want to have the assurance or have some of that information in the dossier. But for me, and this is my personal opinion, putting good summaries into your dossier and then having a clear indication in the notified body opinion that this has been looked at, will then, you, you could perhaps put some of these information then into 3.2 or instead of as a, as a supportive information or, or only if requested during the assessment process. But it, it may not be necessary to put in all of this data. However, some studies, obviously, the, the human factor studies, the clinical studies will be required. But high, good summaries should also suffice, um, and, and obviously summaries of, of key data, but, but not the actual raw reports. Um, but I, I agree. I, I think for the first while, it, it may be that we will all end up seeing too much information as assessors and as MA holders putting in too much information. But as we get more experience with the procedure, and as the note it becomes clearer that the notified body opinions are clear on what has been reviewed, and we have that assurance that it has been seen, that it has been reviewed, that it has been deemed in compliance with the GSP orders, then perhaps we can look to have a lesser level actually registered in, in the dossier. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Which uh, came from uh, industry discussion. Um, that is, we need clarification of scope for the notified body opinion. DSPR of So again, to the notified bodies. Dario is also raising his hand, but here and now Jonathan is raising his hand. One up. So, Article 117 talks of Annex 1 of the MDR, which is the SPRs. Um, so, we are not assessing conformity to other parts of the MDR. Nonetheless, there may be um, other parts of, the, of, of that document that uh, manufacturers may find useful as guidance uh, to answer the GSPR. So the key is demonstrating conformity to the GSPRs. How you do that is, is up to the manufacturer, follow, you know, following uh, standards, following different protocols. So as I said, other sections of the uh, MDR may be valuable in that, but we are not looking through indexes or other articles of the uh, MDR as part of the conformity assessment of this part. But I see Dario uh, Pirovano is also raising his hand. Dario, please. Cannot hear you. Okay. Then I will go ahead with another question from the uh, and that's a question from Albert Massey. Have you seen that are already authorized in the EU and have been placed in within the scope of the MDR, will it be required to incorporate the device information within the dossier at uh, what point? This question. Mm -hmm. 
they're one I of the panelists. Say, I, I missed that question, and I believe it's possibly for the um, competent authorities. Could you just repeat that, please? We'll do so. So for, me, for medicinal products that are already authorized in the EU and have been placed in the market and now fall within the scope of the MDR, will it be required to incorporate the device information within the dossier? And when, at which point? Okay, I'll actually pass this one over to my EMA colleagues because this is more around the actual procedure. So perhaps, Armin, would you be able to take this one? Yes, uh, I, I can try. So if this question is related to the, the timing of the um, information as it becomes available, is that correct, Mike? Um, just In general, yes. But the first point of the question was if it is uh, required uh, to incorporate the device information in the dossier. And the second part was then really when, yeah, at which. The so I think there are two um, aspects, of course. One is that for the medicinal products that are already in the EU, um, and sorry, already authorized, um, and um, there is no retrospective application of Article 117. So it, it really is a would your device or your product, then it may be a question of um, whatever changes they, they may be, that Article 117 then does become applicable. And so when at what point for those that are already authorized, um, you know, they, they will main, you know, they will remain to be authorized, but it then really depends on the, on, on the changes. And I think will be covered in the second session, but I've also Nick his hand, so I give Nick the floor. But, um, I hope you can hear me uh, clearly. It me that if uh, a product is already authorized in the EU uh, on the market, uh, under the scope of MDR, it will already have been authorized as a, a drug device combination product previously. Back to the essential requirements check that the IP has been provided of uh, just a point, uh, probably a lot of the information will already be in the dossier. Uh, and as Armin has indicated, the point of the change uh, of uh, an inclusion of uh, a variation with an end box, for example. Um, Thanks a lot. Okay, I will choose another question from the chat. And let me quickly found something because there was a question for uh, here. And that's a question from uh, Katya Gauchi. Um, for device elements that would otherwise be classified as class one, self-certified, what is expectation from um, the market authorization of one company? A notified body opinion does not apply for these device elements. I think this question can uh, go to a NUMA effective uh, but notified bodies. It's uh, raising a hand. Aaron, Julia, please go ahead. Cannot hear you. Yeah. Article 170 says that 
um, modified body opinion is required only for those devices which under the normal circumstances body involvement. So as clearly and correct indicated for class one devices, a modified body opinion would not be applicable. Says that besides modified body opinion, um, Conformity or certificate can be um, uh, accomplishing the design dossiers, uh, the dossier submission to the um, competent authority, so EMA. So the question is actually now to be placed to the European Commission, who is responsible for Article 117 and the medical device regulation, whether it has been met that notified body opinion should not be provided for class one devices or not or whether um, this is to be probably corrected in one of the next corrigendums or be, being clarified with the NDCG paper. Thanks, Julia. And I see uh, Mike Piocchio Chihino, sorry, is raising his hand. Mike, please go ahead. Hear you. We can see you, but we cannot hear you. <laughs> the system is not particularly brilliant, is it? Oh, we can hear you. And representing. The opinion. Must it be the marketing authorization holder or prospective marketing holder, or could it be the opponent? John? <laughs> um, um, and, um, hands raised, and Mike, you've introduced a sort of a but um, let's give sure. to our EC colleagues, and then we go down the list of the people that have raised their hands. So I don't know if Nada or Maria Chiara, who wants to Yeah, I see Maria is raising her hand. Yeah. Go ahead, Maria, please. Unmute. We can hear you, Maria. Yes. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? No. Very well. Um, ah, okay, perfect. No, uh, I'm sorry to say that uh, the sound uh, is, is very bad, so um, I, I, I'm not able to follow all the discussion, but I understand that one question was raised in relation to which kind of um, activities uh, are needed in case of uh, devices which uh, would be considered as uh, Class one devices, uh, in, if uh, placed on the market uh, individually. So in this case, uh, uh, Article 117 is quite clear. Um, so the uh, the opinion of the notified body w uh, would not be needed. I heard that there was some uh, uh, reference to a corrigendum, and uh, just to say that uh, um, there is no intention uh, at this stage uh, to move uh, to move in that way, you know, in, in that direction, uh, uh, since uh, the provision established by Article 117 are, are quite clear in that respect. Just to clarify this point. Thanks. Thanks a lot. And I see Dario is also raising his hand. Yeah, let me see. If, can you hear me now? Uh, very good. This, you know, is, this is only the tenth different system for for video conferences that I'm experiencing, and this is probably immediately understandable one. Having said that, um, yeah, the tentative that I made before to to take the floor. Uh, what I haven't what I haven't heard, uh, if any, when you have a device which has been CMART according to the MDR. In this case, 
as Chiara very clearly said, uh, to me, Article 117 is clear to say that you do not need an endo. So uh, I was wondering whether the authorities for, for pharmaceuticals had any experience. Uh, I, cannot, I cannot avoid also another thing which at least has told me a little bit. Uh, the guidance document, Section 17, on in speaking about co-package in uh, uh, products in medicinal products which uh, with a specific medical device to be used with, and uh, the fact that this is is bringing a little bit a little in in, in the reader. Probably it would be there is a specific evidence for devices for, for the situation which is listed in Article 117. When you have devices and drugs brought together in different manners under, under, uh, under Article 117, the fact that people is getting confused. So, very much welcome to hear experience when uh, you have this combination part uh, to spend some time one of these days to common understanding of what does it mean integral. I, I, I can bring what it was intended with the directives. Finish with your question. The, the, I have to admit it, I have to think that it is the same. Yes, what is the experience, if any, when you have these integral uh, combination products, medical device is separately C marked, so you do not need the DNBO. Maybe we can give this question to the authorities, but we also can give this question to the industry. So, to take this question, I, I think um, to um, Dario's point, um, if here maybe from the drafting group, Maeve, um, Nick, and, and, and colleagues, on the expectation because um, tracking, yes, certainly you know um, conforms to you know meets the, the, the conformity assessment. But as we're talking about um, products here, I think are any examples, unless somebody can highlight them. But the, the process has really taken all of the considerations on board. And I think as the guidance is clear, there may be some particularities still need to be addressed in the, uh, irrespective of the CE mark. Additional consideration side of any GSPR that have been as marking process. If if you want to take the floor. Um, thank you, Armin. Um, really, uh, the only answer I have is that to date we haven't had any experience of co-packaged um, devices at, under the MDR, so it's not really possible to give you a definitive answer on that yet. Perhaps, Nick, also, do you want to elaborate on that? Thank you, Maeve. Um, good question. Um, what Maeve has uh, not the integral uh, device is not. It's a theoretically um, I, I think it's it's probably highly unlikely uh, to occur. So, um, as pointed out, the assessment of drug combinations done on a case by case basis generally, and the specific to the medicinal product would 
regulators in the impact of, uh, of that particular quality aspect or attribute on, uh, on, uh, on the medicinal product and on the benefit risk uh, is performed for that. Thank you. Um, to continue, I'd like to continue with a really open question um, directed to our industry representative. Um, I would like to understand or, or let uh, barriers within the process or general the process. would talk talk for the industry. Mark has raised her hand. The floor is yours. I don't see the guy. You can hear me? So uh, yeah, so I I think it's a, a question, Mike, at least based on the on the on that we in uh, the industry groups where we the, the um and, and some of the conclusions in the show the process has, has generally been, been, of course, it's uncertainty that makes it a bit more difficult. And, and I think that's why the timeline that we also show that there's a lot of um, question and answer back and forth. I'm not quite sure uh, the, the, where the level is. Of course, as we go through this uh, process, I think uh, things will, uh, will improve just by uh, learning. I also think it's, it's really crucial to um, have uh, alignment and, and, and standardization as much as possible. Um, and, and I think, um, you know, some of that will come with some of the guidance. We come from, from uh, EMA. And, um, so, so all of that will be... And I don't know if I can go um, at the back of that, I suppose, really is timeline for some of these guidance. I think we got some really good uh, clear indications from Team NB on, on plates out, um, but I wonder if, if there's any update on some timing of, of the other guidance, because I think that's really what is needed here to get the process. And if, if I am varying my industry, you can confirm what you said, what I said right now. Uh, our experience the notified body opinion process was um, pretty positive. Um, the process went also pretty fast for us. However, they are of uncertainty due to missing uh, guidances. Uh, funny is him. Then I would like to take another question from the chat, and this chat is from Serge Matoni and representing the FPR here today. I can hear you. Barbota from Vector Dickinson and uh, Team MedTech provide some uh, supplier feedback about the efficiency. Underline one point that is that, in fact, from a supplier perspective, we Times the same data, um, so there is some kind of uh, we provide data that are uh, reviewed uh, by the notified body. I, I wonder, I mean, I would ask if there would be a way to, to simplify this part as it's um, this are reviewed. Can feedback to uh, provide in terms of efficiency is that some of these data may be confidential. Uh, we have been able to disclose the data to the notified body. Not really um, what that process, if it's harmonized today, this way of doing, and it would be some. Uh, on the, the first point uh, from Fanny, I, I recognize that entirely. I, I'm aware that we've, we've been responsible 
the same data via different manufacturers. And there are a couple of reasons for that, but I think your is there a more efficient way to do it is something that uh, we should explore. We're asking each manufacturer to demonstrate compliance to the GSPRs and the documentation provides to us. If they allude to a report which comes from a supplier uh, that contains the information we need to verify that compliance, then we must ask for I, I have asked for a report that I know I have seen, uh, but I can uh, different manufacturers. So it is also about ensuring the legal manufacturer um, understanding the full understanding of the device and has the relationship with their supplier that. All the information that's needed to data annex one. Uh, me. Could you? Uh, I was. Oh, it was. Sorry that there's true information in the documentation. Uh, of all the other bodies do for supplying that information directly, which to do quality assessment, we will not, of course, put any of that information in the body opinion report itself, merely that we have seen the evidence and, and so that way the proprietary information is not shared. Um, but I think your question was about standardization, and, and, and you know, that then comes back down to the difficulty of the fact that notified bodies are separate. Uh, um, on, your, on your first point, you know, I, I, th I think I uh, think there there could be a way forward in in um, in as we follow the regulations. It has to be done on a uh, yeah. Unfortunately. Uh, I, I also have some issues in understanding and following uh, uh, um, the, the discussion in detail uh, because co co connection is coming in and out. But uh, I guess it is important to uh, to, to highlight that the, for sure the, the discussion is very interesting and a lot of points uh, uh, are being risen uh, and um, just want to inform uh, uh, all, all stakeholders in the notified bodies that under the umbrella of the MDCG, we have uh, the MBO working group, the Notified Body Oversight Working Group, and we specifically established a task force uh, on the, uh, dedicated to, uh, to address uh, um, activities to be performed by Notified Bodies uh, uh, with the interference uh, of, uh, with Directive 2001-83, and in particular, uh, um, concerning the opinion to be issued by the notified body according to Article 117 of the MDR. Now, uh, we already started to have a number of meetings uh, uh, quite recently, and um, we also welcome uh, in our task force uh, uh, our colleague from EMA, and our intention would be indeed uh, to start having a dialogue and uh, uh, lo looking at the issue or, or at the matter of the opinion, taking also on board uh, the experience that we already have uh, also at the level of uh, manufacturers and, and notified bodies uh, for those opinions that uh, have already been uh, uh, worked on, uh, as far as understood from the, um, from the presentation we, we, we had uh, earlier. And uh, before, uh, uh, let's say, starting in detail, uh, um, kind of uh, standardize uh, this opinion, uh, find uh, common approaches uh, uh, to be taken by notified bodies, we realize that there is for sure the need to, uh, to, um, to provide some clarification of uh, uh, fundamental uh, aspects, uh, uh, which are uh, also uh, we, uh, a number of which have already been uh, 
mentioned uh, during this uh, Q&A exchange. For example, uh, the definition of copecat devices, uh, the drug device combination, the integral, non-integral. So, uh, uh, first of all, uh, there is uh, a need to have a common, common understanding of what we are talking about uh, in order to have the basis uh, on which we can work on and then look at the, um, the, the approach to be taken in a, in a consistent way for, uh, for the opinion to be issued by notified bodies. And uh, so j just to say that uh, this, this is a work that is ongoing. So we have already uh, uh, a number of member states uh, uh, taking part in this task force. Uh, as I said, uh, colleagues from EMA, our intention would be also to involve uh, notified bodies uh, when, when it will be needed. So we will uh, consult uh, the notified body coordination group directly. Uh, which is established out under our uh, our regulation in order to have also notified bodies representative uh, in and uh, try to to have a thorough discussion uh, um, on on the matter. For sure, there are a number of uh, elements of uncertainty so that that have to be uh, clarified and, and addressed, and this is this is indeed uh, what we what we plan to do. Yes, that's uh, everything from my side. Now, I, I don't know if Nada, if my colleague uh, uh, is able to, to join. Can you hear me? I'm sorry. I'm of time. I, I, uh, I'm so sorry that I have to. Um, but uh, we have to wrap up our session. Uh, now the audience a short break before we can go uh, to the next. The agenda point, which is then already uh, life cycle management and substantial change. I would like to to thank you for your question, for your comments, for your active during this session. You, your questions are not deleted. Uh, we will find a way um, to work on this and to answer as much as possible. And I also apologize that we were not able to cover questions. Uh, during the sessions. It's uh, easily, as always, too short, and I also apologize for all the technical uh, difficulties uh, facing. And I uh, hope to uh, see and hear you again at 3 o'clock for the next session. Um, we will now go into uh, session two on life cycle management. Um, which I will be co-moderating with uh, Tim Chesworth. Um, Tim, did you want to introduce the speakers? I will go ahead and uh, do so. We will again have three presentations. We will start with the industry presentation um, on life cycle management by Amanda Matthews representing FPS. Um, so today's presentation um, is also a cross-collaboration across industry, um, and this is to consider life cycle management aspects of integral drug device combinations. I've already seen in Article 117 doesn't address products that are already on market and potentially what is expected if a change is being managed which could potentially invoke the requirement for a notified body. So, uh, for a notified body opinion. So today's presentation, we're aiming to present the open questions that the industry has on this topic, as well as key aspects that could help guide companies in making this assessment with regards to the change they're managing. Uh, and then, if time permits, we will look at some uh, typical past examples the key considerations. What we have is when is a change a substantial change? Well, based on this and, and managing change, when would a company need to engage with a notified body to seek uh, their assessment of the device or the change being managed? The leaders right now in this. Uh, assessment is the statement that's captured in the Q&A document from last year. As a change that affects either safety or performance of itself and 
the responsibility of the marketing authorization holder to determine if it's substantial. And could a company uh, go about making that decision? From an industry perspective, there are possible pathways. Either it's a uh, guidance from a medicinal product perspective, and that is what takes precedence. Alternatively, the precedence being taken from that of a medical device and its key guidance. Since to recognize that the pathway is taken as the primary, um, the approaches are quite different, particularly when it comes to change management. Um, from our perspective and, and from industry's perspective, we see that these, these products are being placed on the market as a medicinal product. So we feel it's important to align with overall guidance from a medicine perspective, so that we consider and uh, make reference to the relevant considerations for the medical device constituent itself. With this in mind, and seeing this as a medicinal product, we would particularly look to the following two guidances to assessing a change. We use va uh, variations guidance um, would be pivotal with regards to, to medicines, but recognizing that there are some possible limitations to this particular guidance with regards to the nature of changes that we're managing. I think we'll maybe come to see some of that as we go through the examples. Potentially, we could also look to consider ITHQ-12, which is outlining and um, put, putting forward a risk-based approach with regards to assessing a change and the impact of that change. So we feel that that could also be potentially important to consider. Well, considering that these are managed um, as medicinal products, industry has several open questions uh, with regards to, to this. Firstly, we're seeking input from EMA with regards to the framework by which we can actually assess change. We're looking to uh, understand what it is we need to be considering to make sure that we have consistent decision making. It's important, and we're looking for this. Uh, framework to be defined, but ensuring that it's commensurate with how we manage changes as if it was other aspects of the medicine, like an exercise, for example. Knowing that changes require regulatory oversight prior to implementing. Here, when we're talking about device changes, that flexibility could also be taken on board and when a notified body is needed. Secondly, it's that we actually understand what we mean by substantial. And for us, we see that being very much triggered uh, and connected to when we would actually then trigger and invoke a seeking a notified body opinion. Strongly advocating from the perspective that this is looking at uh, the change and the nature of the change with a risk-based approach in mind. If it were a substantial change, looking to show we, um, that we were no longer within the defined, established parameters that had been previously approved. For us, this is where we see the connectivity to defining it being substantial. This based approach um, does align with what is being suggested in guidances such as ICHQ-12, um, and currently that uh, guidance also does indicate integral drug device being within scope. So it is potentially an option to consider um, as part of overall guidance for change management. We have heard numerous times across um, external meetings and conferences in the past 15 months or so, the bodies themselves have actually said that they see themselves as the decision makers here. From an industry perspective, we're really the pathway and being able to engage with EMA and competent authorities if we have challenges and borderline products with regard to whether or not the change is substantial. We're trying to understand what and what framework could be available for us to solicit advice on that. So in considering a little bit more than um, a risk-based approach and what principles and what this could look like, it's important to recognize that any change that a pharma company would undertake would be done so under a pharmaceutical quality system. 
could be a level of information data identified change. There are some guidances available that support how you could approach a change assessment, including the recent ISO 2069 guidance that was issued last year. It promotes a based framework too. Um, that guidance is more uh, prompting the users to consider the impact and the nature of the change and what potential data and information you may require for that change far as actually determining what the subsequent regulatory filing action would be. That we understand this and whether or not uh, the nature of change being managed requires prior approval or potentially a lower classification and more notification. And on that basis then, the variation that the company puts forward, would it require a notified body opinion? This is where there isn't any current guidance available and this we see being connected to what actually we define as being substantial or not. So therefore, from an industry perspective, we're really looking to utilize this risk approach. And if we can determine that any change to the device remains within the established parameters and certainly the performance and safety and other um, aspects being considered are not impacted, then from our perspective, we would see these as a lower risk change that we're looking to put forward and not necessarily requiring a notified body opinion to support that variation. If, however, the change um, certainly did show a change to your product performance and you no longer remained within those previously approved um, specifications or established parameters, then most certainly um, that would be much higher risk with regards to the change you are managing and therefore deemed substantial such that you would be looking to have a notified body opinion to the variation. So what is the appropriate framework then? Um, certainly, you know, there are guidances out there that could um, be looked at as a potential source to help define this. But it's really, from our perspective, seeing that there isn't anything truly at this point um, that I think covers maybe some of the nature of changes that we're looking at with regards to these integral device constraints of a medicinal product. As we've heard already from prior uh, presentations this afternoon, the farm, the pharma company's quality system is not in scope as an notified body and is not in scope of Alex One. So then if you look at guidance available with regards to, to managing change, how much from a typical device guidance um, such as the MDCG guidances or the prior MBOG guidance is actually truly applicable in this case and, and could a pharma company be held to? Because certain guidances are uh, written with different relationships between the company um, and the notified body in mind. From our perspective with regard to obtaining this assessment um, from a pharma company perspective, we don't foresee that we are held to maintain this assessment that we gain from the notified body with regards to the medicinal product. It is seen as a, a snapshot of that product that you are going to commercialize. And we don't see that uh, the opinion itself needs to be maintained, and each change going forward as part of the life cycle of that product is certainly then assessed on a case-by-case -case basis. So for an industry perspective, certainly we're seeking some clarification and input with regards to this framework. We're trying to ensure and certainly advocating that it's proportionate with regards to changes that we are managing across the complete medicinal product. It's important to ensure this to uh, maintain consistency and also retain efficiency going forward with regards to managing these products on market. So with that, I'm just going to um, switch slightly to, to look at some works examples of some typical changes that um, you know, we've sort of gathered from input across different companies, just to highlight some of the aspects that I've talked about um, earlier. Not necessarily going to go into too much detail with regards to each of the cases in the interest of time, um, but what we will do is just highlight some of the key thoughts um, and whether or not we feel that the change would be considered substantial um, such that a notified body opinion could be required. So in this first example, um, it is with regards to a change in the medicinal product. 
um, rather than an immediate device change. But however, with an increase in concentration of a solution to be delivered, um, it's actually changing the physical properties of the solution itself. And as a result, there does need to be a device change. And in this example, it was the spring driving the injection mechanism. So we have a device change, but from an overall device performance perspective, when tested, it's shown that post-change, there's no impact to the functional performance. And actually, the original specification of performance and what had previously been established do still remain with prior defined specification. And in this case, it was injection time and injection force were not seen to go outside of that prior specification. So in this example, whilst there might be a change to established conditions of the medicine, it's shown that there's no change to the device-specific specification. And therefore, we could conclude that no notified body required in this instance to support the actual variation itself. It's important to recognize that from the previous principles that we suggested, if this device change had actually changed the performance and we were no longer able to meet that specification, then we would be suggesting that a notified body opinion be required to support the variation at the itself. In this next example, um, it's one where there's a change to the state needle um, of a pre-filled syringe. Um, and the example is that actually the internal diameter of the needle um, was changed uh, from the assessment of this, so the needle length remained the same and therefore still um, giving a subcutaneous injection. Again, when we look at what um, the registered uh, detail or the registered performance and, and prior established specifications for such products, in this instance, uh, for the pre syringe, it dose accuracy. And it was shown that this internal needle uh, diameter change has with regards to that particular attribute. There's also um, important to make sure that we, you know, we look more broadly with regards to the other implications of such change. And this is a manual delivery system and delivery is controlled by the user. But there was shown to be no change in overall patient, patient use or any of the interface with regards to patient material such as the ICU. So based on um, this assessment, again, it was concluded that this particular change was not substantial and therefore also wouldn't warrant as seeking a notified body opinion to support the change. Just as a highlight, though, with this particular change, because it was a, um, a true example that was put forward by a particular company, um, that it actually fell into the Z category of the variations guidance and was seen as an unforeseen uh, category. So I think this is just highlighting some of the uh, potential um, challenges with the EU variations guidance in that necessarily cover all particular change types that a product uh, from a, of a device change to an integral product that we may actually be managing. To um, the next change, and I think that with this one, I'll, I'll um, spend well much time on this with, uh, to make sure that we have our other presenters this afternoon. It's talking about withdrawal of the e-mark, um, whereby a supplier didn't uh, no longer actually supporting the CE declaration that they had provided for a needle safety guard. It's actually doing from an um, MAA perspective was actually just changing uh, where the ability lies to then the evidence supporting Annex 1 conformance. So rather than um, relying on the declaration from the manufacturer, um, the marketing authorization holder was incorporating evidence, um, verification, and data reports with regards to this particular aspect itself change in actual uh, device design and change with regards to GSPRs that were previously applicable, they remained applicable, deleted. And from our perspective as we viewed it, it came down to an administrative change and one that might have required reporting and based on what information was already in module three. This sort of goes to highlight I think the, the current 
new guidance talks about the deletion of the device. The device in this instance isn't being deleted, it's just a shift in emphasis with regards to where that responsibility lies with regards to showing conformance to Annex 1. It's also seen as an unforeseen change. Certainly, um, with regards to some other of the change examples that we've shown, it's important to sort of recognize that actually, based on what information we do have in Module 3, not necessarily going to invoke even it as a reportable change. And, this, you know, and certainly looking at the draft quality guidance that is under consideration right now, there are certain changes that a, uh, a company may make that doesn't warrant um, within the granularity of what's already shown in Module 3 and therefore wouldn't require us to make any variation either. And just with regards to um, bringing this um, from our perspective uh, in industry, we're really looking for guidance with regards to how we can drive a consistent approach when evaluating change at the of the device component of a medicinal product. Um, striving to make sure that this is um, a risk-based approach. Um, certainly looking towards guidances that are already out there that have this framework in mind. It ensures that we can retain some degree of regulatory flexibility, uh, driving consistency for when we actually want, need to seek a notified body opinion based on the nature of the change. It's important to ensure um, that, and certainly we seek that any framework that is defined actually accommodates device changes as a constituent of the medicine that we're managing today, but also is well placed to be considering the emerging technology as innovation evolves. We in relation to future consideration of any guidance being developed um, in this space to support this. I'll conclude, but thank you. Thank you very much for that presentation. And we will move right on to the next one, which is uh, by Peter van Leuven and Colm O'Rourke, uh, representing the notified bodies. Um, thank you for the possibility to speak on behalf of Team MB. Colm and I would like to present the Team MB's perspective on life cycle management under Article 117 of the MDR. We will skip the education. Uh, um, the purpose of this presentation is to present the draft team and position paper on life cycle management, communicate the criteria team and be uses to determine substantial, highlight any distance that may exist between and industries substantial changes. will include. Uh, determination of some of the examples given to us by FPR during the preparation of this workshop, and these are the same uh, examples uh, previously shown by Amanda. We would like to seek input from EMA and national companies on how best to resolve any such discrepancy. At this stage, for our following discussion and to increase the understanding of the device world, I will first explain how notified bodies currently handle uh, changes of medical devices. This slide shows the use of the process for medical devices. Uh, this is a similar slide to, uh, John and Julia presented earlier. I would like to focus on the process part after initial certification, so that's the process after step four. Changes after initial certification of medical devices are notified by the device manufacturer to the notified body through a notice, change notification. So that's indicated at uh, step five and step eight. Change notifications could lead to an additional audit or to an outside review of the manufacturer's technical documentation and the change in scope of the certificates. We have 
have several ways to handle device changes under MDG and MDR. Change notification search and ask to be there on site during a normal surveillance audit or renewal audit, whichever takes place first. Option is a change notification can also be reviewed on site during QMS audit at the manufacturer. This is the case when a new critical subcomponent the existing device outside the scope of the current certificate. For example, a different size is introduced. A third option is that smaller, non-substantial changes are grouped together and reviewed during an off-site renewal review of the technical documentation or during a renewal audit. And it's important to note that during this renewal review, we would also verify that all changes have been categorized correctly and that all substantial changes have been notified to the notified body. So notified bodies can handle changes differently depending on the device and it's also important to note that in the system, there is an ongoing oversight of the device manufacturer's change controls. However, the aforementioned options are currently not available to the notified bodies under Article 117. UMS audits and renewals are outside the scope of Article 117. And as such, notified bodies will not perform any audits, and there is no role for notified bodies going oversight of the MAH change control process. It will be not clear who will be in charge of the oversight of this change control process and who is to check changes have been categorized correctly into substantial and non-substantial changes. We therefore consider a CMB that for lifecycle management of Article 107 products a more robust system must be developed going forward, and cooperation and alignment between various stakeholders is key. Let us look briefly at the existing guidance on life cycle management. We have Q12 and a more device standard 2069. Both these guidances include a framework using a scientific and risk-based approach for the assessment of the impact of changes. Consistent with ISO 13485 14971. In addition, we have the current variation guideline and the MBOC best practice guide. Indeed, but this is still valuable. We have the Q&A document and the draft EMA guideline, which hopefully will be finalized uh, soon, uh, but it has been postponed until May 2021. And we got an announcement that NDCG is working on a guidance on notified body opinions. So far, bodies have not been involved yet. Zooming in in EMA Q&A, uh, this document points out that in case of substantial changes to the device reassessment by notified body and notified body opinion is required as part of the variation submission. And the EMA Q&A further clarifies that it is the responsibility of the marketing authorization holder to determine if changes are substantial. It has to be noted that the MAH can liaise a notified body to obtain a notified body opinion. However, there is a well-established practice among notified bodies that notified bodies cannot provide any advice to industry. And currently, framework within the MDR that allows notified bodies to provide a service in the determination change to industry. Furthermore, the current variation guidance is not clear on how to determine whether changes are substantial, and this brings us to the team and B position paper that we present now. So this position paper is intended to be a discussion of the device-related changes which will potentially require revised body opinion. has been developed to create alignment between notified bodies on interpretation of substantial changes. And the concepts of aforementioned guidances, as well as years of experience 
and notified bodies have been taken into account in the draft team and B position paper. The development so far is that team and B decisions from EMA and national competent authorities several weeks ago. And I would like to thank EMA again uh, at this point for the valuable feedback we have received. And this feedback has been included in the draft of November 2020 that some of the participants have received for the purpose of preparing for the On the completion and agreement by uh, other notified bodies outside our Article 117 working group, the paper will be published as the team and B position paper, and we are aiming to do this early 2021. And now I would like to ask Colm to walk you through the position paper. Hi, Petra. Thank you very much. So as Petra has outlined the development of the paper so far, um, I'm going to get into a bit of detail of what we actually have in the paper. So we have a number of different elements, uh, and one of them is a definition of substantial change. So I think this is a really important point to discuss, obviously, um, and it is Team NB's view that a change is considered substantial when it is likely to have an impact in terms of device safety or performance, compliance with any of the applicable GSPRs, and then device-related claims and intended use, or a change in user. And I think, you know, based on the conversation so far and, and Amanda's presentation, and, you know, I've been keeping an eye on, on the chat here as well, I really think it's this element of likely um, where we consider a change substantial if it is likely to have an impact is perhaps where there is a difference of interpretation and you know I look forward to, to us discussing that during the day. So we define a substantial change. Um, what else do we have? We have a number of flow charts. So there is one main flow chart and we have five sub flow charts. So these sub flow charts deal with various elements, changes to intended purpose, changes to design or performance spec, change to component or material, change to sterilization, and also we have a chart changes uh, relating to software specifically. So we also have some explanatory notes, which I'll mention in a second, and we have some examples. Now this is, is an image here of one of the flowcharts, and we're going to look at that a little bit more closely in the examples section. So in terms of um, the explanatory notes, I think it's very important. Uh, the first point here is that, um, and this has been mentioned a few times already, is that changes in relation to the quality system were outside the scope of the paper. So due to the fact that the, the uh, quality system is outside the scope of Article 117, obviously we did not include it uh, in terms of the paper. Then this next point, I think, comes back to, again, the, the classification or how we define a substantial change. So Team NB would consider it best practice to define a substantial change at the outset. So when it is a proposed change, you look at the proposed change, and our view is that you assess that change, and if it is likely to have an impact, performance or specifications, then you would consider it a substantial change. So a situation where you know you, you change one device component for another and your subsequent V and V data shows that this new component does not alter performance or specifications, we would not consider that then a non substantial change simply because the V and V data showed there was no change. Our interpretation would be the change is classified at the outset and it is based on the likelihood of the proposed change affecting safety or performance. So again, I think this is where you know there's perhaps a difference in interpretation. Um, and like I said, we'll speak about it during the Q&A. So also an important point is how does the paper apply to legacy devices? So for a legacy device uh, that's already on the market, um, and if there is if there is a change to a device component, what do you have to do? Well, essentially, you will need to submit full GSPR documentation, um, and we will generate a full notified body opinion. And again, this is the assumption that a notified body opinion does not already exist for this device. So I think the point here is that we cannot deliver a partial notified body opinion on all changed aspects if we have never delivered a full notified body opinion on that device. So hopefully that's clear. And then we get into the example. So for people I'm sure will have access to these presentations afterwards, we've worked through I think four or five of the FDA examples, but in the interest of time, I'm only going to speak one of them now, um, and then we'll, we'll have more time for Q&A. But 
anyone that's looking at the presentations later, there are other examples that we have uh, we have worked through. We've put them through our flowcharts. So when it comes to using the actual flowcharts, uh, these are just a few important points. Um, first off is that you assess each change separately. That's really, really important. You would begin with the main flowchart, um, which then directs you out to one of the sub flowcharts, which is, is relative to your specific change. You then move through this specific flowchart and the end result is, is two options basically. Either the change is determined to be substantial and then our take is at that point, you know, a revised notified body opinion is required or an initial one if one has not been previously granted. Or um, you're directed back to the main chart. In essence, the change is non-substantial. Uh, you're directed back to the main chart and um, continue on through until you finish. So. We are now going to, like I said, a number of examples. We're just going to work through the uh, first one. And Amanda presented already. This is the, the change in relation to um, formulation change, which affects the viscosity. So um, I think we should all know the background. Amanda presented it uh, very clearly. And the important point was that subsequent V&V data supported there was actually no change in performance. And therefore, the FBA determination was that this was a non-substantial change. Do then we're going to take our um, keeping the first moving straight to the specific flowchart, which the the one relative to this change flowchart number three. This is an overall view here. We're going to go into a zoomed up um, view now, so you can see it better. So we start at the top here and move into the first diamond, which talks about a change of ingredient. Was it assessed in a previous opinion? If yes or no, and then you move through the next one. Is it a change in material or a change in formulation? Yes or no, and you move through. And I was going, I won't go through each of these boxes, but this is giving you an idea up close of, of what you're doing. You're answering yes or no. And you can see at the end here, on the right-hand side, if you land on this, um, then the change is considered substantial. And if you're at the box on the left, then you're directed back to the main chart, and essentially we've said that the change is non-substantial. So specific to the change at hand here, the formulation change, the relevant um, diamond is the, the second one here that's highlighted. So change to a material containing a medicinal product or change to the formulation of a medicinal product. And we have a notice with this one as well, actually, and it's over on the side here. And it talks about a change in the characteristic of the drug which could impact the performance, such as a change in viscosity. So when assessing this change, come to this diamond, we feel the appropriate answer would be yes, because it is a change in the formulation. And the result of answering yes to that would be that we consider this a substantial change. And again, this really comes back to that difference in interpretation, where we feel the change is likely to have an impact. And if it is likely to have an impact, we would consider it substantial. And again, just an important point here that the proposed device related changes should be classified at the outset. So that's the end of this first example, and like I said, in the interest of time, I won't go through remaining examples, but I will continue on um, to our conclusion slide here. Please have access to the slides afterwards. Um, feel free to work through the various examples. In conclusion, on behalf of Petra and I, um, I suppose it's quite clear that alignment operation is key. So it, it's, it seems obvious that there are different interpretations when it comes to a substantial change, and you know, it's very important that we align, and that's, you know, that's, we've got a fantastic opportunity with all the relative stakeholders, um, you know, in the, in the virtual room, so to speak now, to, to try and decide what way, you know, we need to go on this and how changes are to be um, considered. Also, I think an important question is next steps. So if, if a device change is considered substantial by our, using our flowchart, what happens then? What exactly is the sequence of events? And this, I think, kind of referenced already in terms of timing, you know, timing in relation to the variation and how it gets incorporated. Uh, and then I think, you know, final point here, which is really important, is who is the final decision status of the proposed change? It would appear that the MAH is the final decision maker. Uh, but then I think, is there a framework for the MAH to, to consult or discuss a proposed change with either EMA or the notified bodies? And Petra alluded to this already. So, you know, notified bodies are precluded from such detailed discussions with clients right now under the MDR, and, and we were under the MDD as well. So acting in a consultative manner is not really something notified bodies have the ability to do. So I suppose if, if it is envisioned that the future framework would involve 
some form of consultation with a notified body, I suppose our question, perhaps the email, would be what is the regulatory basis for this? So Article 117, you know, is quite limited in its text. It obviously doesn't um, it doesn't account for you know a framework like this. So if that was to happen for notified bodies to do it, there would need to be some regulatory basis for us. Um, to be able to provide that service. So again, I think that's something you know that will be interesting for us to discuss in the Q and A. So that is it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed for the presentation, and we will move straight on to the last one, which will be the EMA considerations on life cycle management, and it will be presented by Pascal Venetti. Pascal, please. Yes, thank you. Um, yes. Uh, I would like to say a few words on um, on post authorization activities in relation to Article 117. But keeping in mind that uh, for certain aspects uh, there is no or, or limited experience, and also Article 117 is, uh, is silent on on life cycle management, resulting in uh, uncertainties for for the handling of uh, post authorization changes, uncertainties regarding the um, uh, involvement, uh, responsibilities, uh, interplay between EMA, uh, NCS, and uh, notified bodies. And this is precisely why uh, we are discussing this today. Uh, first, um, a question that many have been asking is, of course, what is a substantial or, or significant change to a medical device? Uh, the term substantial change can be found in the medical device regulation, but maybe in a different context. It's about uh, uh, quality management system. Uh, the term um, substantial uh, change um, can be found um, is also mentioned in our uh, Q &A, uh, on the implementation of the MGR. And in the Q and A, we say that um, changes to the device component are considered substantial if they affect the uh, uh, performance or uh, safety characteristic of the device. And we should also consider um, the intended purpose uh, of the device. So it's quite uh, general, but from a, a medicine perspective, um, we could assume that a change is uh, significant if it impacts the uh, quality target product profile, the uh, CQA, the uh, overall control strategy, the administration of, of a medicinal product, and also the, um, the instructions for use be, uh, because of the potential impact on uh, uh, medication errors. But as you know, there is no legal definition of a substantial change to a medical device. We have the uh, recent MDCG uh, guidance with uh, references to uh, significant changes in design or, or intended purpose. There is, there is also the um, ISO standard 269 on um, changes to drug delivery systems, which may also be relevant. But uh, I guess um, more specific uh, guidance on this topic would be uh, preferable. Um, Another important point to um, to keep in mind is that um, there may be different perspectives on on this issue. Um, what could constitute a, a significant change for us may not may not necessarily apply to a notified body, and vice versa. And also, um, from um, from a medicine perspective, um, the impact of any change on the overall product quality, safety, and efficacy should always be viewed in the light of a particular product. So one may argue that it is on a case-by-case -case basis that we can um, uh, determine whether a change is um, significant. And this is probably why uh, in the guideline on a uh, drug device commission product, we don't use this terminology of substantial or, or significant change. Uh, and actually, um, regardless of the significance of a change, from a medicine perspective, uh, marketing uh, authorization orders uh, should always comply with, uh, with our EU um, specification guideline on variations, uh, which is the next point uh, that, uh, that I would like to address. Our classification guideline um, follows the risk-based approach. The problem is that um, for scopes related to uh, medical devices, it's quite restrictive. Uh, it's basically limited to the addition uh, deletion, uh, replacement of medical device, and also um, changes to uh, container closure system. And because of these limitations, an increasing number of device changes are classified as unforeseen. The so-called Z category is usually a type 1B variation, but it can also be a type 2. And we also have case-by-case um, -case requests for Article 5 classification recommendations. 
So it's probably not the most um, efficient way to deal with uh, device uh, rate changes. Um, our um, regulatory framework on um, on variation, I think, it would clearly benefit from uh, from a review for for different reasons. I mean, for example, to take into account the uh, principles and tools from ICH guidelines. But here, I would like to focus on um, on medical devices. Um, for example, it would be um, uh, important to consider uh, design uh, changes to to the device when there is a potential impact on the quality, safety, efficacy uh, of a medicinal product. Another important point is that um, um, the P41 category uh, in our um, classification guideline refers to um, measuring or administration devices. But what about integral devices falling under the scope of Article 18, second paragraph? And a good example here is uh, uh, could be a tablet with an embedded sensor. And with the development of um, new technologies, I mean, this type of DDCs falling under Article 18 will probably become more um, commonplace uh, in the future. So I guess in general, it will be um, important to try to um, um, future-proof uh, the system by considering uh, new technologies, novel combination products, uh, digital therapeutics, software applications, um, et cetera. And um, another aspect to, um, to consider is that many integral uh, devices also act as container closure system for the drug systems or drug products, uh, for example, the barrel of the pressure storage. And it's not always clear which variation category applies. There is before one um, for medical devices, but then there is also B1C or, or B2E for um, container closure system. And um, another important point um, is that our um, classification, classification guideline does not currently um, mention what specific changes to the device uh, require um, a variation. Um, in, in general, there are, um, there, are, there are four different scenarios. Uh, the first one is that um, it is possible that minor changes to the device will not trigger a variation and will not trigger an update to the notify uh, body opinion. And I think an example was provided on, uh, in the first presentation. Um, a second scenario is that a variation would have to be submitted, but without the need to revise the notify body opinion. Well, the problem here is how will we know that an updated opinion is not needed in the variation package? I mean, in this case, um, I guess it would be nice to have some some sort of statement from the notified body confirming that no update of your opinion uh, is needed. But in practice, um, we'll have to see um, if it is possible. And the first scenario is actually the other way around. I mean, we could perfectly imagine that um, a change would um, would affect the notified body opinion, but will not necessarily result in a variation. But an interesting question in this case is, um, do we expect that the notified body opinion in the dossier is systematically updated? Um, I, I cannot give you a, a definitive answer, but for sure, I mean, this would create um, additional burden for, uh, for marketing uh, authorization orders. And the last scenario um, is, of course, a change that would require both a variation and new or, or updated notified body opinion. And the question for us here is how an updated opinion will be presented because um, it will be important that assessors have um, clarity about what was changed, what was the scope of a review by the notified body, what was the outcome of a review by the notified body. So um, I guess the, um, the important point be behind, this, uh, this, behind these four scenarios is, is probably the need to develop uh, interactions between uh, EMA, uh, national product authorities, and notify bodies. And of course, it goes beyond variations. I mean, this is very relevant, obviously, for initial uh, marketing authorization applications and, uh, and even for scientific advice. And, uh, and here, I could, re I could refer to our um, regulatory science uh, strategy to 2025, because 
one of the core uh, recommendations is to create um, an integrated evaluation pathway for the assessment of uh, medical devices. And um, the last part of the slide, um, it's, um, uh, I want to mention um, it's ICHQ12, uh, ICHQ12 Gala and last cycle management. Um, because in Q12, there is an important concept of established conditions, which basically defines what type of information in the dossier is subject to variations. Uh, drug device commission products are within the scope of Q12, but there is no detailed guidance. Um, I mean, we need to keep in mind uh, differences in legal framework between the different ICS uh, regions. I mean, maybe in the future, an example of established conditions for an integral drug device commission product will be developed. But the challenge will be that, I mean, it will have to be compatible and acceptable to, uh, to all regions. And I'm not even talking about um, uh, terminology, which may be different between ICH regions. In the meantime, um, it's important to stress that established conditions are currently not reflected in the uh, EU uh, regulatory framework on variations. I'm not in a position to tell you uh, when, uh, if it will happen, but I think any implementation uh, for drug device commission products would probably require uh, careful um, considerations. Uh, I think it's the last slide, and um, I, will, I would just like to provide some general considerations in relation to life cycle management for, for integral uh, DDC products. First, um, there is a general expectation that the medical, man, the medical device manufacturer will notify uh, the marketing uh, authorization order for the medicine of all changes to the device because, of course, the, uh, the MAH um, takes full responsibility for, for the medicine and they may ask to perform a risk assessment to determine the potential impact of a change on quality, safety, and efficacy and whether the submission of a variation is needed and if a new uh, or updated notified body opinion is, uh, is required. Um, an important point is that I mean, we can advise on, on variation matters. So, for example, if a variation should be submitted, uh, what scope, if it can be grouped with other changes, what data should be uh, provided, um, etc. cetera. Um, and I guess here it would be uh, important that in the future maybe uh, EMA and NCS can keep track of all the requests that, uh, that we receive. But what, what we cannot do um, is advise on um, notify body opinion matters. So in this case, if a change is um, significant enough to trigger a new or revised notified body opinion, the reason why I'm saying this is that uh, we received several um, queries on this specific point. But I understand that uh, notified bodies uh, will provide guidance uh, to, to define um, device changes that would lead to a, a new or, or revised uh, opinion. So in case a change to the device part results in a, in a variation and a new uh, notified body opinion, our expectation is that the opinion would be submitted uh, in the variation package at day zero. I don't think a parallel review would be uh, realistic because variations have uh, short timelines, I mean, even, even tag twos. And um, another point I, I wanted to fly is about changes to the drug product potentially impacting the device. Um, it could be, for example, and I think it was mentioned previously, uh, an increased volume or, or higher viscosity, which, which may affect the performance of the device, which may then require further uh, verification or, or radiation work. And the question here is, all this type of change will be handled between the notified body and EMA or National Competent Authority. Um, another aspect uh, to consider is, um, is also changes in the intended use or target population. I mean, it could be, for example, um, um, an extension of indication, which may or may not be combined with quality changes to the medical device. And in this case, an additional usability study may be uh, required. And the last point um, is that our quality guideline on drug device commission products should, of course, be consulted. Um, the focus of the guideline is on dossier requirements, but this guideline is a scientific guideline, so it does not cover everything. So it should be read in conjunction with our um, Q&A on the implementation of the MDR, which covers more um, regulatory and uh, procedural aspects. 
and there is also, of course, our uh, general uh, post authorization guidance. Uh, we are currently working on an update Q and A in collaboration with the Commission, and we hope that we'll be in a position to to publish it soon, um, together with the final guideline. And uh, that's it for me. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Fantastic. Thank, thank you, Pascal. I uh, really appreciate uh, your, your input. So what we'll do now is we will move on to the, the Q&A uh, um, So many questions coming through on the, on the chat, but uh, there's some other questions prior to, uh, to today. So I'm going to sort of lead off with those. But before I do that, I thought it might be useful just to perhaps kind of frame some things around principles that we're, that we're to help the discussion. So when we're talking about these products under Article 1, Fundamentally, medicinal products. They are not medical devices. So they are medicinal products that are constituent within them. So I think we need to be really careful about terminology that that's what we are, what we're talking about. So when we, as we say that these products are medicinal, their regulatory requirements and the approach that we take should be that for medicinal products. That is the, 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 the regulation that should take evidence here. Um, and therefore, any changes should be assessed and managed via the medicinal product variations framework. Um, and I think that very much came out in, uh, in the presentation from Pascal that, that we just heard. So the question becomes, how does one reconcile the fact that uh, the, the device part is not sort of, uh, has quite to the other parts of the medicinal product, nevertheless, how do you manage that by the overall medicinal product changes guideline? Um, so I guess I'd like to lead on then to the what was uh, brought out by uh, Colm in the Team MB presentation about um, how does one consider changes. So the question initially then is directed at uh, EMA, so maybe Pascal, if, if you could, uh, could respond to this. So please can EMA confirm that the MAH's quality management system or full quality system products aligned with ICHQ10 takes precedence when considering a change for medical devices, because as we've just said, single integral drug device combinations are medicinal products and regulated as such. This is really important to clarify as the two types of QMS have fundamental differences in approach. A medical device QMS works from a position of looking at that could impact safety or performance in order to determine whether it is significant or not. Whereas under a medicinal product QMS, it has to be shown to the change uh, of safety and performance to determine whether it's significant or not. So I think this really speaks to the heart of that was coming earlier around this notion of to, to impact versus shown impact. So maybe Pascal, if you could call that and then to Team MB after that. Um, I mean, in, integral uh, drug device commission products are, are regulated as a, as a, as a medicinal product. So, so yes, uh, from, a, from a medicinal perspective, I mean, the uh, funds called quality system uh, in accordance to ICHQ10 is the one uh, uh, to be considered for, for life cycle management. And, and, and would you also concur then that when we talk about change, that any change must be shown to impact uh, or to, shown to affect or change the safety and performance rather than it could impact or is likely to impact? Well, um, actually, I, I would I would like to, to to refer to our to the core precept of our of our guideline. I mean, for us, what's important is is uh, is the impact of uh, of a given uh, change on the quality, safety, uh, and efficacy of a medicine, and and this is an important element to to determine whether uh, a variation uh, needs to need to be submitted and, and and what category of variation needs to be filed. Um, I don't know if uh, uh, other colleagues uh, in, the, in the drafting group would like to, uh, to complement my, my, my feedback? Good. It, it would, if others wanted to contribute to, the, to the, that would be most welcome because I think this is an absolutely critical issue uh, saying that these products are medicinal products and must align with the guideline. Then this notion of being shown to a change being the trigger significant changes and to ensure that alignment but perhaps if there aren't any additional comments from uh, uh, from, from 
FEMA or the competent authorities. Uh, perhaps invite Colm to, to comment from a notified body perspective. Yeah, Tim, sure. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. I think it's, it's brilliant to, to kick this off with that very clear um, question, you know, because it is, in some ways, it's as grey and all this is, it, it's almost black and white, you know, which one is it? Um, and I suppose we certainly recognise that at the end of the day, the overall product here is governed by the medicinal product, um, you know, directive. So, obviously, we're going to take our lead from, uh, you know, from EMA, National Competence Authorities, but I suppose when we're asked the question, in our opinion, what is a significant change or substantial change, well, then we have to fall back on what we know and what is familiar to us, and that is how we would assess this as a medical device. But, of course, we recognize that, you know, if that's not appropriate for this, well, then there obviously needs to be a middle ground. So, you know, we will take our cue, um, you know, from the regulators here, um, really. So, any any further comments from any of the from EMA or the Compton authorities on on this? So I do think it is is a really critical thing that this it's kind of in terms of how we make progress on this issue. Tim, if I could jump back in, sorry, just the one point that I don't know has been raised so far is is to do the ongoing oversight in terms of the change control process. So obviously as part of a notified body opinion, that's completely outside our remit um, as notified bodies. So I think in terms of determining what's the most appropriate way to consider substantial changes, you know, thought has to be given to the ongoing oversight of that change control process. And, you know, recognizing that's outside our control as a notified body, because if, you know, if we go with the option of, you know, shown to have an effect, then there's likely going to be very few of these changes coming into us for an updated notified body opinion, which is fine, but it, then it comes back to, you know, is there a third party that change control process within the MAH to ensure that the correct decision is being made, um, you know, or a sample is taken, whatever it might be, because that, that certainly is outside our scope um, as notified bodies. Uh, absolutely, and that's so that, as than bodies is that it, it is not responsibility to make a determination about whether a change is or isn't substantial. Um, it's ultimately, it's the, the MAH's decision to make that determination, but as an MAH, it's about making that determination based upon appropriate guidance. And then that guidance then uh, variations, guidelines, or that, that best would be a, a logical way to proceed. Fantastic. Perfect. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, indeed, very interesting discussion, and, and thank you for all the presentations here. Uh, it was definitely, let's say, enlightening uh, to, to start these discussions, at least from our perspective. This is uh, the first time that we've been looped in, uh, at least fully uh, uh, in a workshop environment uh, on discussions related to variations. And I, I think we do agree that when we're talking about uh, variations, obviously those are uh, under the uh, Directive 2180-3EC. This is uh, actually uh, the, the medicinal products framework. And um, in fact, uh, when you're talking about the combination products falling under 2180-3EC or, or the regulation on medicinal products, then of course, uh, these are defined by, uh, let's say, uh, the uh, the guidelines issued uh, in accordance with the medicinal products framework. But I think it's important to note that when we are talking about potential changes to the device part, uh, et cetera, um, which are uh, in an integral uh, drug device combination, uh, then we are talking about device change in general. And at least from a preliminary perspective, we don't believe that a substantial change for a drug device combination device component is very different from a general guideline on drug on um, let's say substantial changes for devices. So I think I echo what the, the notified bodies earlier intervention uh, was that uh, they would still look at it from the device perspective in order to assess if that's a substantial change to the device part of the integral, let's say, drug-device combination. Okay. Thank you. Could I just sort of ask a follow-up uh, question to, to, to that, that input? So in terms of that re I, reviewing the device change, I think the, the perhaps an important thing is around that threshold, around you know looking at a change being substantial, whether it's likely 
impact on something rather than it is shown to impact on something because there's an element there about being consistent in how you look at different types of changes across the different elements of the medicinal product. Um, so I wondered if you might be able to comment on that. Um, actually, at this point, I don't think so. But uh, I think we'd be very happy to actually uh, bring this back to the, the task force itself. I, I don't want to give a preliminary response, which, which might be incorrect. So uh, as mentioned earlier by my colleague, um, uh, we, we have established this task force. We are working in collaboration with the EMA and Certain Medicinal Products Authority on, on the different uh, guidance, which is under development, and, and we are happy to, to take this uh, also in the future discussions that w will take place there. Fantastic. Um, can I then link that, that to uh, another question that, that we've had in, in relation to the, um, the future variations guideline? So it was, it was mentioned um, by Pascal. Uh, I guess many of us will have seen this week that the European uh, Commission has published a pharma strategy for, for the future. And, there is a specific mention within that document about opening up the variations guideline um, starting in, in 2021. Um, I guess the, the question is, is there a, um, a definite commitment or intent on the part of EMA and the Commission to incorporate uh, drug device variation, or sorry, changes to the device part of drug device combinations within that update to the variations guideline? Um, I don't know if that question is back to the Commission, uh, but uh, as you know, we're the, from the Sante B6 Medical Devices Unit. Uh, I'm not sure if there are uh, colleagues from B5 on the line who are the lead uh, unit on the pharma strategy. We do work in collaboration with them, especially when, uh, to things related to the medical device or in vitro diagnostic regulatory framework. But in, ter in terms of the variation potential review, uh, I, I believe I, I have not been part of those discussions, so I apologize. Okay. Um, because I, I think that that feels like that would be a really good long-term solution to this, in that there would be clarity then for all stakeholders in terms of what the approach is to, to, to change for, pro for these products, which would include uh, substantial change in the link to Article 117 um, as it amends 2001 um, 83 EC. Uh, but I recognize that these things take time, um, and within the Pharma Strategy document, it talks about updating these variation guidelines between 2021 and 2023, uh, which is still some time away. And, and, and the actual implementation of this is going to be May of next year. So, so that brings me to the next question that's been raised in, in terms of what do companies do in the short term in trying to understand what constitutes a substantial change or not, and what are the important guiding principles to assess a change in terms of it being substantial, recognizing that it's the MAH that has to make that determination. Um, sorry, Tim, I don't want to take away your question, but I see that Nick has still raised his hand, so maybe this is still pertinent for the previous question. Thank Brilliant. Thank you, Elena. Hi, everybody. I hope you can, can hear me. Um, there's two or three questions there. So um, just build on on the fact that um gut perspective um change we we consider that the, the authorization holder uh is is the one who determines the impact of a change for a device change i don't see it as being any different than any other change to drug product or drug substance or whatever that is defined underneath the uh, the variations guideline. So I expect it to be treated in the same way. So if you are making a change to manufacturing drug product and you're changing the active substance supplier, well, then you evaluate the risk of that change and you, you do some work to demonstrate that it's, there's, there's been no impact. And, and I don't think um, that different change. The, the marketing authorization holder is the entity that is responsible for, for putting the product on the market. With regards to how you can determine the, the uh, category of that change, uh, guidelines talk about recognizing that the variation guidelines 
is somewhat deficient in uh, in these different categories, as as, uh, as indicated. Um, we do also recognise that uh, from a, a risk-based perspective, value the the impact of the change with respect to any of the critical quality attributes or other elements of the control strategy the overall control strategy and, and take those into account. And I think the example that Amanda put up in, in as much as minor change um, ended up being a type 1A, um, whereas if you had a much more significant change, oh, sorry, a significant impact, um, of course it would be a higher category variation. Um, go to your last point. I think that when the, um, the variations guideline is updated, that we should uh, consider adding categories to take into account uh, or to provide some more granularity, as we do in the same way, for example, with changes to manufacturing processes for parenteral products or uh, sterile products or, or indeed oral solid dosage forms. So I, I think that um, value in, in providing that clarity to, to all stakeholders, not just industry, but also to regulators as well. Thank you, Thank you Nick. And perhaps to come back to the point of what does industry do between now and May of next year? Um, you know, clearly your industry changes are being made to product, uh, and what what is the expectation of how we are supposed to, to manage that in the in the, over the coming six months or so? Um, in order to, to get ready for that uh, May 2021 um, deadline um, when there isn't any guidance in place at the moment in terms of how we would assess whether the change is substantial or not. How do we deal with that short-term change? Well, I think, I think industry has, has mechanisms in place already to do that. And that's the point I'm sort of trying to make is that already you, you assess the impact of changes. Um, um, and you have presumably have been doing that for a while for drug products where you might be looking at the impact of a change taking out the uh, essential requirements checklist that was provided with, with, uh, for, for that particular combination. So, and, and this is a personal view, is, is that it, it seems that we have mechanisms in place to uh, apply for this way, non-DDC uh, medicinal products, and and I don't see a significant difference between a non-DDC medicinal product and a DDC medicinal product uh, in in principle, if you like, and, and in in the, in the basic approach. So uh, there are mechanisms available already which can be leveraged uh, in in the uh, in the interim. Okay. Um... So I can see that Amanda's got a hand raised. So Amanda, do you want to come in now? We can. Go ahead, Amanda. So it was um, it was just following up on what Nick was saying um, with regards to how we currently assess changes. Um, and in his view, and I appreciate it's a view, but not assessing it any different um, just because it's a, a new, uh, device a drug device combination. Um, than we would any other change against the variation uh, guidance. So my interpretation, um, Nick, of, of what you're saying um, is along the lines that if we actually show that we have not impacted um, performance or product quality or changed uh, patients, if we look at it with regard to the GSPRs, then we can consider that in the context a lower degree of change and therefore wouldn't require us to seek a notified body assessment to review our data. I think it's up to the MAH to, to define the impact of the, the, the proposed change and if necessary decide whether or not there needs to be a consultation with a notified body. Um, refer back to the fact that you know the MEH is the uh, legal entity responsible for placing the drug product on the market and so therefore the responsibility for 
um, maintenance of the dossier and showing that the product is is and, and effective with the the, the market authorization holder. Okay, so I can see Colm, you've got your hand raised, so please go ahead. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, um, I think it maybe it comes back to the one of the other questions that we've raised is, I suppose, how is there? I mean, is there a suggestion here that notified bodies should be involved in the process of determining whether something is substantial or not? Um, and I recognise that you know there's kind of no point in having a framework for that if ultimately our you know, we have one stance and industry have another, you know, we, we will need some sort of concrete guidance one way or another on that. But I suppose it would be a question that, you know, if the MAH makes a decision and then if, you know, if they are to consult with a notified body in order to either validate that decision or that we as a notified body would disagree, I just don't see that there is a process for us to do that right now. So I don't know if, if EMA or national competent authorities have any comment on on sort of the mechanism for which industry can liaise with notified bodies, um, because we, as it stands, we don't on what regulatory basis we can offer that service, so to speak. Okay. There's some important questions there, um, so it'd be really good to hear a, a response, perhaps Sadiq Pascal or, or um, Armin, perhaps um, will be good with you. Tim, I, um, I can give a very uh, a, a, a brief um, view. So I, I think when um, you know when we drafted the Q and A, we, we put this um, into the Q and A. There may be some mechanism where a um, notified body may have to come into the picture, and the, the reason for that being, and I think you sort of you know it was alluded to by by all of the um, the contributions that. Although we talk about a medicinal product, it does have this device component. Article 117 produces now a mechanism where the device component is assessed, reviewed by a notified body. You know, rightly so, because this is, you know, what they've been doing for quite some time. But the question really then becomes on how do you ensure that if you go forward, and there are some changes, and yes, you know, the, the risk assessment, the way this has been assessed, as Nick has said, really change, but you have this component that was evaluated somewhat differently and separately to an extent by a notified body. So if you then consider the whole product and there are some changes, and you know, all along, you know, in, in um, sort of different parts of, of the finished product, it may then raise the question, and I think, you know, whether this is a theoretical, which could easily turn into a practical question, is then competent enough to assess that whatever the MAH may have done in their risk assessment is actually correct, that you may then find in your assessment that, oh, hang on a second, you know, we may not agree with the marketing authorization holder assessment, and perhaps it turns out to be substantial change. We'd like to avoid, I suppose, you know, these kinds scenarios where you then are in a position that becomes quite difficult for the assessor in itself or the evaluation authority, the marketing authorization holder, notified not involved. For legacy products, as has indicated, you know, they've never seen this product before. That's sort of another layer of complexity. So yes, I think forward we may need to have that discussion on how to some kind of mechanism, and I leave it open on how it looks like it, because you know there's nothing in Article 117 that you know so suggests so that. But it comes down to a very practical way of approaching it. If you really do have questions, you don't want to be overwhelmed with questions. At authority guidance can only go so far because it's a case. Study. So you may need to establish this kind of mechanism. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Armin. Um, I can see Petra, you've got your hand raised, so if I could come to you next. Thank you. Um, yes, I, uh, I agree with Armin, and I just wanted to point out that uh, we will be in charge of the oversight of the control process of the MAH, and we will check whether the changes have been categorized correctly into substantive 
for more substantial changes. Um, oh, I'm I'm not sure where this is uh, included in in the regular GMP inspections. Uh, perhaps you can comment on that how it's um, currently organized. Uh, if I could, at this point, link in another question that's come in related to the point you've just raised, Petra. So it's, you know, can um, EMA expand on their thinking on considerations to establish a process for interactions between EMA national competence authorities and notified bodies? Um, so I think this was a point that was uh, was made in uh, in Pascal's uh, presentation. So perhaps Pascal, if you wanted to maybe comment on that, that, that would be much appreciated. Yes, um, I mean, in in my in my presentation, yes, I, I mentioned the fact that I mean, I gave a reference to our regulatory uh, science strategy document, uh, strategy to 2025, because in this document there is a there is a recommendation, but it's a general recommendation to uh, to create uh, an integrated uh, evaluation pathway uh, for the assessment of medical devices and there also other aspects. So this, I guess, implies uh, interactions between the different players. But I mean, it's quite general. We I don't think we haven't been into a great detail. So I think the uh, work has to be done to uh, to determine what is the best way to to interact. Um, I mean, it could start, like I said, from scientific advice, maybe, and then initial market automation application, and and of course, uh, life cycle management. But I cannot be uh, specific uh, at this stage. So I can I can see we've got Armin and Nick with their hands up. So maybe so let's come to Armin first and and then to to Nick. So please go ahead, Armin. Very briefly to what uh, Pascal has said, I think you know most, if not all, of participants are aware of the network, the regulatory science strategy. Call it a vision, a plan, go forward. And um, I think Tim, you have mentioned this in your introduction as well. That um, just was it yesterday or two? the EC Pharma strategy was published and they do make reference that and it's recognized there needs to be an enhanced dialogue I think is the wording that has been used now of course these are long-term plans they don't happen overnight we will face these kinds of discussions and scenarios rather soon because May is not that far away you know again this um, form it's an opportunity to really raise awareness above anything else, and there are groups established, as you know, NADA and colleagues have um, already referred to some of those issues. And I think you know we need to prioritize them to get solutions as much as possible ahead of May or just in time for May, as companies having not just a legacy product as they go forward that there is a, a mechanism really in place on how to do this. I don't think we can be specific today to elaborate, but I think we all see and recognize that something needs to be done outside of just guidance, which can only go so far. Thank you. So Nick, we'll come to you next. Thank you. Um, it, it's interesting to hear this discussion um, around, uh, around how of the trinity, if you like, of, uh, of organizations, the MAH, the, the, the notified body, and the competent authority interacts um, with regard to medicinal products containing a, a, a device component or a device part. Um, I just want, and this is a que perhaps a question for, for notified bodies and industry, is, is what are happens currently for what I would call device drug medicine, uh, medic, uh, medical devices, where the device has a primary mode of action and Auxiliary medicinal substance. I mean, are there these sorts of problems in those consultation processes, or both the initial consultation and then the supplementary consultation? Is there something there that we can that we can apply from to the medicinal products? Uh, I can see Julia. Go first on this one, please, Julia. Okay. So um, currently, the medical device directive or the medical device regulation reply, uh, requests manufacturer to report change on the medicinal substance to notified bodies. Whenever those changes are 
substantial with regard to the quality of the medicinal substance, how it's incorporated to the medical device, um, any kind of uh, test, testing which is uh, performed, um, and also with regard to the specification, notified bodies are required to uh, submit a variation consultation or supplementary consultation to verify that the quality and safety um, of the medicine of um, and not um, negatively impacted by this uh, additional change. Hope this answers the next question. And uh, come to Dario next. Yeah, the, uh, just to integrate what has just been said, uh, have if you have a change in your in your device, and your device is submitted to an evaluation from the notified body in order to be CMART, you have to communicate any change, and it will be a discussion with the notified body whether or not these will require an a an extension of the evaluation or even a new certificate. Now, when this comes to the drug device combination, to the device drug combination, sorry, then you have to include also these kind of considerations. The device is affecting the drug uh, presence or whether the, the presence of the drug is, is, is different from what it was initially. And uh, and the, the same happens when you change the drug or where the drug is modified. In this case, you have to communicate this to the notified body. There is a process through which you go to the competent authority who delivered the first, which could be EMA or a national competent authority. And on the basis of that, if appropriate, the uh, it is changed. It is, it is quite straightforward, and again, it is a matter of uh, discussing between the manufacturer of the drug, the manufacturer of the device. Uh, if any change happens, they have to decide uh, uh, how they are going to tackle the issue. They are under the obligation to speak with the notified body who did the, 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 the. Again, we are speaking about C marked devices. We're not speaking about these which are not marked and which are used to be placed uh, together with, uh, with the, as it is the case, device. So I'm convinced that the, the use of C-marked drug device combination will become extremely popular. The, the, the system looks like to be Far less. Thank you, Darius. So, come back to Nick. I think he wanted to make another point. Yeah, and, and I understand um, the process and how it works. The point I'm sort of I'm making is is that there is a process that seems to work reasonably effectively um, without um, significant barriers. And there's an opportunity for us to look at how that process works and think a little bit about how. Uh, a creative, consultative process could work for the, for the uh, from the product perspective. So, so that's really the point of my my suggestion is is to have uh, that, that seem to work. Uh, so, you know, what about those that makes them work, and and how can we apply those that sort of thinking or or, or ways of working to product side? Okay. Thanks, Nick. Uh, and I see that uh, I think shirsten has got you have got your hand raised. You would like to make a point? Okay, unfortunately, didn't see that we can we can hear from you. Um, perhaps we sort of to turn it more in terms of next steps of where we we go with this. Um, in, in giving that a more near term guideline guidance to industry. Um, are there any maybe a question for for Armin uh, in terms of the Q and A document? to significant change to some degree, is there an intention to make updates to that document between, you know, in the next couple of months, two, three months, let's say, to give industry a little bit uh, more clarity in terms of the expectations around substantial changes? Uh, you know, where, where the variations guideline, the changes to that are some way off into the future, 
what would you see as the sort of the, the short term next steps uh, to, to help everybody you know uh, deal with this situation? Tim and everyone, yes, very good question, of course. So I will have to give a holding answer here, in the sense that um, we are working with different stakeholders, particularly with the Commission, and you know, as was uh, mentioned, the newly established task force there to re add new questions to the existing question and answers document. Now, to what extent questions in relation to substantial changes can should be covered in there, we'll have to, uh, again, sort of, you know, referring back to the uh, conversation that um, the, 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 the guide, um, the draft guidance, you know, gives some principles. The variation guidance we all recognize is somewhat limited. I think the approach, as was shown today, is a first step in the direction. Um, you know, we've had conversations with Team NB. They've taken our comments on board. I think that conversation needs to continue. It shouldn't stop here. Um, whether it's in the background or, you know, with different channels, um, trying to combine all of the contributions together. So hopefully, you know, as we approach, as we get closer to May, more for everyone involved. Thank you. Yeah. And, and if I could just build then on what you just said, that do you, is there potentially a mechanism where we could have some kind of, um, you know, trial type discussions between uh, the regulatory agencies, competence authorities, notified bodies and industry to advance this? Because I think this discussion today has been tremendously valuable in getting the, those three key gr groups around the table. Um, do you see any opportunities to be able to do that um, in order to to get resolution to some of these open questions, recognizing that clearly that does present challenges of, of, of meeting and discussing uh, in, in particular ways. It would be interesting your thoughts on that, Armin. Again, uh, an answer that uh, people might not, not like uh, that it's holding. So yes, of course, I think today you know, the, the objective really was um, to listen, to learn, to discuss, because there's a lot out there that uh, the two paragraphs of Article 117 um, have created you know, enormous amount of questions. I think we've made some progress. Uh, it's good to hear that people have, that have gone through this process have some great experiences, I think, was one of the words that, that was used, or it was painless, perhaps, to some extent. It may not always be the case, but it is a learning process. Uh, and I think, you know, as, as much hates me to say, um, we have to be somewhat patient. That doesn't mean that there may be, you know, and again, I use the word mechanism as we go forward, that there may be another opportunity that we all seek. I think we, you know, before we jump on that, I think we just have to be very clear of what we want to get out of it. I think, again, you know, today that was, I think we've made some progress. Yes, we've collected a lot of questions that we have to, you know, about address within the different groups, but it doesn't mean that there will not be another opportunity, you know, in this try for quintet um, to, uh, to come together and, and discuss and, and lay more than just the basis for next May. Thanks. That, that, that's great, Armin. I know from an industry point of view, and I'm, I'm sure from Team MB's point of view, that, uh, that, that we obviously stand ready to, you know, engage in those discussions. Um, you know, that that's really, really important because, you know, keeping up that momentum of what we've, you know, what we started today is, is critical, particularly with Matt just being around the corner. Um, so to the that, um, and to kind of round things off, I know we've got a few minutes left of, of this uh, this particular discussion. Um, I, I guess then what I think I've been hearing throughout the discussion is that there is this absolute agreement that these products are medicinal products first and foremost, that the variations guidelines are applicable to them, um, that the it sort of guidance at the moment is for industry to use its um, best interpretation, its best endeavours in terms of, in, you know, using the current framework to determine whether a change is substantial or not. Um, perhaps an interest in, in a comment from uh, Nick or Armin or recognising that we're in these times of ambiguity until we do get guidance. Um, do, you, do you foresee that there will be a certain amount of um, forbearance on, on the part of uh, the regulatory agencies in terms of these kinds of changes, um, in terms of how you know things will be implemented, in terms of we find a variation that we consider not to be significant, um, 
we've done that in absolute good faith, and there is a view that perhaps, well, that substantial change. I'd be interested in your perspective on that, recognising that clearly changes are ongoing at the moment, and May 2021 is very close to, to us. Uh, Nick or Armin, if you wanted to, to respond to, to that. Um, not particularly, but uh, yes, I will. Um, I think um, I, I think we have to recognise that um, for any variation that is submitted, particularly um, which are not do not have a set of conditions or documentation associated with them, so typically type two variations always be uh, an interpretation of what information should be presented and justification why which the MAH makes versus what the uh, what the regulator then that and thinks about what is is the information that's provided sufficient to, uh, to address the concerns that the regulator has so I, I again perhaps it's not um, an answer you want to hear but I think Perhaps it could be considered that there isn't that much difference between what we're proposing and what currently occurs now. Um, you know, um, as the MAH, you put forward your your proposals, your justifications, um, and then as a regulator, we we examine those justifications, we consider them, and we think about the amount of information that's been provided and whether that assuages our concerns or not. And if it does, then there are questions, and if it doesn't, then we questions. So I think, again, it, it doesn't, it seems to me at least anyway personally that necessarily to what is currently going on um, at the moment. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Right. Thanks, Thanks Nick. Um, so I, we are pretty much at time uh, for this session. Uh, so just wanted to say thank you to all of the contributors to this uh, session, all the presenters, uh, all those who contributed to the, to the dialogue, uh, the questions that have been raised. There's a huge amount of, of, of questions that have come through and, and general commentary via the Q&A chat, so hopefully that, that can be preserved. Um, but I think there's a huge amount of content now that will be very valuable in, in taking this discussion forward. Um, I think that's perhaps kind of the sort of closing comment is, you know, it's, it's really, really important that we take this conversation forward. Um, and you know, we, we hopefully we can find ways to, to have that conversation, to, to work things out uh, between the different stakeholders as we go forward. Um, perhaps in the in the closing part of the workshop that we're going to move into now, um, it'll be great to hear from Armin and perhaps from from others in terms of, of where do we see the next steps for this? Where do we see the opportunities to to continue that engagement and that that dialogue between all of the uh, the different stakeholders that have been uh, contributing today? So, and I think with that. I will close at that point, and I think I hand it. I think I hand it back to you at this point, Armin. I think. Yes, sort of. Uh, so I will ask my um, colleagues that um, have control over the presentations to um, bring up the um, presentation by Nick, um, a topic that you've all been waiting to hear. So um, I'll give the floor to Nick for an update on the guidance. Nick, the floor is yours. Thank you. Go ahead. OK. Thank you. So um, <clears throat> I'm going to provide a very short update on, on the guideline and the status. I think it's, it's clear to me um, that, uh, that there is a lot of interest in, in this guideline and, uh, and when it will be, will be published. And so this update is, is really for a transparency perspective um, being delivered because I think the last public update that was given was at a virtual conference in, in May of this year. Um, so this update is quite, quite short, and so we're not going to discuss anything outside of the guidance. OK, so I, I think it's important to highlight that the, the drafting group, we, that the drafting group fully understand uh, the urgency of the stakeholders um, have, have indicated around the need for this guideline to be uh, and we are very focused on completing these activities um, such that we will be able to publish the guideline prior to implementation of the MDR in May 2021 
And I think this is a consistent position that we've had in any of our public updates, that we are very uh, mindful of, of the, uh, the, the need of the stakeholders, particularly industry, to have some surety or some, some, uh, some guidance around expectations from a regulatory perspective. So just to provide an update on, on what's happened, in March this year, the final draft was discussed and agreed that the two relevant working parties at the EMA and also at the CAT, the, uh, the Committee for Advanced Technologies. Um, once we had this solid regulatory position, we went uh, for a final consultation with the Commission. So the Commission had been involved uh, previously in, in, in the discussions around the, the guideline uh, and appropriate to go for a final consultation. So the first phase of this consultation was uh, started in April. Um, uh, as a result of discussions between ourselves, uh, the drafting group, the EMA, and the um, raised uh, guideline was provided to, uh, to the Commission in uh, late July, mid July, for the comments. And, and further to, to receiving this draft, we now have a second phase uh, underway um, where we're continue, continuing the discussions. Uh, and as Nada has already indicated, that that discussion uh, is underway with uh, with the uh, the task force. Um, this will be completed in due course. Um, if, if we move on to the next slide, please. Um, at this moment in time, I can't provide you with uh, any any timelines for that. All I can say is that once the final version has been agreed, it, it will then get circulated for adoption, the working parties again, and the CAT, typically guidelines that are adopted by the working parties or the committees um, are then adopted by the CHMP in the month following the adoption by the internal stakeholders. And then once it's been adopted by the CHMP, the guideline can then be published on the EMA website. And um, typically there's a an elapsed period of time before it comes into force, um, and I can't I can't say what that that period of time will be. But we are conscious that we 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 want to have or we need a training program. So in regarding training, it is intended that we will deliver a program to competent authority assessors via the EU NTC mechanism that it, that already exists. The scope of the program has to be decided, um, but it will almost likely cover the, the, the three, um, the, the, uh, the, certainly the, it will, there will be input from the three working parties, or uh, and the two working parties rather, and the CAT into that. So there may well be a chemical, one uh, session with focus on chemical entities, another one with the focus on biological entities, etc. Uh, the need for external training is still to be determined. And certainly, I would um, be interested to hear some feedback from external stakeholders in this regard. So um, hopefully, that gives you a feel for, for what's going on uh, with regards to the guideline. Um, just again, to reiterate that we, the drafting group, our, our, our intent is to, to have this uh, guideline available prior to implementation of the MDR. And we do recognize the importance of this guideline uh, to, to the stakeholders. So uh, the next slide, please, is just to say thank you for your attention uh, for, for this very short presentation. Yes, uh, thank you, Nick. And um, we uh, are now on time again. Uh, and um, it's my great pleasure to um, close the, um, the webinar today. Um, with, with some final remarks. Now, I know words sometimes don't express it uh, in the appropriate way. I'd really like to extend um, a massive thank you to everyone, uh, to those that really supported the, the creation of this webinar with um, the, um, I think, in a very true spirit of the stakeholder um, across the aisle, reaching out across the aisle and, and putting a lot of effort into the presentations, providing the case examples, sharing the experiences as they are still limited, but I think 
for those that have gone through the process as well as for those that um, are still yet to go through the process, I would anticipate that this has already been um, quite a good step forward in the learning process of what you already can consider before you submit all of your technical documentation to receive a notified body opinion. So I think from my perspective that um, we've achieved that goal uh, or that objective um, from, from the beginning. It has also highlighted, of course, that there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. And um, I'd like to you know, refer to the team notified body uh, presentation to what Jonathan has said, that uh, there have already been versions of notified bodies from an early to perhaps you know, some uh, more current ap approaches on how they were conducted because everybody learns this is something completely new. There really is no direct precedence. I know there's established processes and we've mentioned some of them already, you know, what can we already utilize, what works well, but it's not a direct match. These are different, you know, these are different products because they're differently regulated. Yes, you can um, adapt some of them. Yes, you should really take some learning. You shouldn't reinvent the wheel. And we should always keep in mind uh, for most of the products that we're actually talking about, your preferred syringes, inhalers, and pens, for time. So this new process should matters, but really provide the necessary assurance and safeguard. Uh, expertise is involved in think that when the product does reach the market, it reaches so uh, it has been reviewed and assessed by all the necessary uh, expertise. We just finished the discussion on the substantial change and um, we anticipated that this would be um, a quite difficult discussion, uh, one that probably even required more time uh, because there's a lot of uh, uncertainty, still uh, somewhat different positions. I think from at, at least Doing the, the different presentations and also from the discussions that we're not that far apart, but there is a lot um, that's in the details, and I think they still have to be clarified. Um, I'd like to share with you one good uh, piece of news. Um, I hope it is anyway. Um, I think it was mentioned at the beginning and uh, on the website that this uh, webinar has been recorded. I uh, do apologize for any technical difficulties, for any quality difficulties that you may have experienced. I personally can say it worked well for me, but I, I, am, I, I do understand that it didn't work well for, for many others, so I, I really do apologize. I am assured that the recording should be of uh, good sound quality. Um, it should be available, perhaps just in time for Christmas, so this is a present to all of us uh, in case you do have some time during the holidays that you want to uh, listen to it and revisit uh, and perhaps you know share your reflections in, in, in some way with us. Uh, there will be a um, some kind of output of this webinar uh, in the form of a report that you know still we, we need to discuss on, on how best to, to go about it but so there will be something addition uh, to the report and of course as Nick has already mentioned this will really translate into um, training, learning, but also uh, in further guidance, whether that is Q&A or other uh, documents. And that brings me sort of to the next steps. So while we necessarily identify you know, concrete actions to take forward, I think what um, everybody, everybody contributed to today has certainly the list of things that we need to work on. There is now a, um, a task force behind the device authorities, the medicines authorities, uh, EMA on, on the table to, um, to figure out the best way to provide assurance to the applicants. And when I mean applicants, it really is the, as, as, as much assurance as we can provide to device manufacturers in all likelihood work in partnership with the, the pharma biotech companies to generate the final product that, that then falls under the medicines um, regulatory framework. And it is recognized that 
sometimes we are on different planets. We may mean the same thing, but we use different language or we use a different language and we mean different things. And so while, again, you know, we've, um, devices are nothing new, they've been around for a long time, just like the drug device combinations, there is now a, um, a let's call it a renewed interest, certainly uh, a lot of attention on how we can move this, this forward to really generate um, an environment, a mechanism, and a platform that um, ensures that from the beginning until the end, everybody understands what is necessary at each step of the way. So with that, you will see um, updates of Q&As that will address um, hopefully many of the comments and that, that we received and that we also discussed. Uh, they may take some time, um, but we clearly have May 2021 20, inside, so we'll make sure everything on our side that this goes um, in the right direction. And I've taken on board your suggestions to keep the momentum uh, and see what other ways uh, of fora there are to discuss this, completely realizing there's a lot of technical discussions that need to be had and the right people need to sit around the table. So all of these are taken on board. Um, we'll communicate uh, in due course on, on what we can do about it. And so with that, a minute left before the five o'clock um, end of this webinar, again, my warmest thanks to all of you for participating, uh, for contributing, for engaging discussions in this rather difficult virtual environment, but I do hope that overall you've had a good experience and that you did take some good value out of today's webinar. And again, thanks on behalf of everybody that participated and um, contributed to making this a reality. Thank you very much, and um, we're not too far away from the holidays, so um, uh, good holidays to all of you. Thank you very much, and goodbye.